Okay, so I think we, we are going to start uh, now. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Uh, as you know, this is the Green Growth uh, Summit it is 2023. Uh, the reason why we like doing this conference a lot, uh, and I work for Bloomberg, so as you can imagine, we care about this topic greatly, is because it's very good at putting together the key topics, but also bringing in very good names that kind of get the pulse of where the situation is with regards to the politics, but also the companies and, and just the overall science. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I also want to say, of course, uh, just for housekeeping, that in every panel, there will be time for questions for you. So it's not just me speaking the entire day here. So if you have questions, all you need to do is you put your hand up, you say who you are, and then you address a question to whoever you want to address a question. And also, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, we do have also a way to send questions uh, online. I'll be checking them on my phone and there is a hashtag which is the green growth uh, summit 2023 you send them there and i will read them and put them to our speakers and then before i begin the first uh, session i also want to say uh thank you to the partners that put this together obviously it's the green growth partnership the clg europe which is represented by ursula here but also thank you to a number of ministries that have put together uh, this agenda and helped, and they are the climate uh, ministries for Germany. Uh, we'll, we'll be joined by a German envoy in the next uh, panel, also the climate ministry of Norway, uh, Finland, and the climate and environment ministry of Portugal. And now on that note, let's start with the first uh, session. Uh, so we're now joined by Ursula Whitburn, who we know. I told you to switch on the mic, and it's me that's not switched on. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Laura, obviously, uh, well, we all know you, you're the director of uh, CLG uh, Europe, and we're also joined by Kurt Sonderberger, who is, uh, of course, well, you we also know you, you're the director general for DG Climate at the European Commission. The point in this session, and we talked about it uh, earlier, uh, this conference is usually very succinct, but this year it's different because it's this 10th uh, year anniversary, you take stocks, but also you project uh, yourself to the future. So, Kurt, if we could start with you, I wonder if you maybe could take stock, but also how you see things playing out in the next 10 years. All easy questions. Okay, very happy to be here. Happy anniversary to the Green Growth Partnership. Uh, 10 years, we need you a lot longer in town as well in the next uh, 10, 20, maybe 30 years. Our horizon is 2050, as you know. So I do wish you good health and lots of impact uh, for the next uh, 30 years. 2013, 10 years ago, was uh, the year when uh, the emission trading system entered its uh, phase three. We introduced then a single EU-wide cap on emissions and imposed auction as the default tool for the allocation of uh, ETS allowances. Okay. And Sorry, can you pick up the microphone? Oh. I've been signaled over there, <laughs> just to make sure that it's not even... Okay, is this better? Okay, very good. So it's um, 2013 was also the year in which we um, introduced, entered with ETS in its phase three. Um, it had massive benefits so far. Um, we have been able to reduce emissions in the ETS sectors by more than 37 percent. Um, and since 2013, 10 years ago, ETS has generated 152 billion euros of revenues, which for the most part are reinvested in climate and energy. Um, and I'm saying this because it's the 10th anniversary of the partnership, but also of this ETS uh, phase three, which has really become the jewel um, and the workhorse uh, of our climate policy. And it's also why I think those of you have, who have heard uh, Mr. Hoekstra during his hearing say that he fell in love with ETS. That's the reason why he fell in love with such an abstract thing as uh, ETS. Um, so it's on that basis, uh, namely putting a price on pollution, that we have been able to make a lot of progress in the last few years. In 2018, the Commission uh, presented the Clean Planet for All, going for the ambition of making Europe climate neutral by 2050. Um, 
and we then had an agreement on the 40% reduction target um, for 2030 until the current commission came into uh, office and said 40 is not enough, we need more, we need to go for 55 at least by uh, 2030. I'm saying all this to uh, really get a message across that you don't build these transitions in one year or in five years. It really needs a long-term vision with lots of stepping stones. And we've been able to uh, put in place the Green Deal on the basis of lots of pre previous instruments, experiences, uh, etc. I think with the Green Deal, we now have a whole of government, a whole of economy approach uh, to transitioning uh, to a climate neutral economy, but one that is also very importantly decoupling resource use from economic growth um, that better values and treasures our nature and does all this in a socially fair manner, the just uh, transition. That is really, I think, what this commission has been able uh, to achieve. There is no way back on this. There's no way back. Everyone understands there is no alternative to this anymore. I should say, though, that when we launched the European Green Deal with this ambition in 2019, we were often told that we were idiots for giving up our competitive advantage and inflicting all these costs on our economy. We were told, why does Europe do this alone if the rest of the world is not following? Well, today, 2023, we see a very different world. We see a world where others may be overtaking Europe and where we risk losing our competitive advantage in clean tech and green economy. China is investing more in renewable energy than the rest of the world combined. We know in the US what uh, the IRA is doing in terms of attracting investment. We recently had big announcements from the African continent, which is also turning the page and saying we are the continent of the green solutions uh, for the transition. So what is very important now for us is that we stay the course. We stay the course um, as we have done in the past years through a pandemic through very negative impacts of the dreadful war on Ukraine um, and most lately the um, challenge that the IRA is throwing to us. We have stayed the course each time we have reacted, not by decreasing our ambition on green, but rather to the contrary, redoubling on our ambition and our efforts. Um, and the result of this is that it is now finally understood that climate and sustainability is not only about the planet it's really about the economy it's the economy stupid um, which brings other challenges uh, with us but we've seen for example the statement from um, mr sunak in the uk uh, of um, not going that fast well he got actually a lot of pushback from the business sector itself um, for having confused the investment signals. Um, so that is a very welcome uh, development. They said once you start, it's actually more difficult for business to go back and figure out where you wanna go. What is very important is predictability and consistency. And if you start changing the signals and the regulatory framework, business doesn't know anymore and you become untrustworthy as a government or as a public authority. And what we see is that this transition needs a very sophisticated interplay between the public and the private sector. Um, it's much less of the free market that we had before. Of course, the market still remains the most powerful mechanism. That's why we go for ETS, which is a market-based mechanism. But the interplay between public and private sector becomes much more uh, important. So you asked me what it means for us um, in the near future. Well, I think what we now need to do is concentrate on implementation not have endless debates about ambition, is our ambition right or wrong, but implement what we have agreed with the Fit for 55, with the National Energy and Climate Plans, etc., and mobilize investment. This is really now for the next 10, 15 years, an investment agenda. So we really need to mobilize lots of investment. Secondly, we need to uh, work much more with and for industry. Uh, that's definitely the wake-up call we got from the IRA. Um, we are creating a massive market in Europe for clean tech, for green products in the future. We cannot afford that all this market is supplied from outside Europe, because if that happens, we can't sustain 
or climate ambition. So industrial competitiveness is name of the game also to succeed in the Green Deal and the climate transition. And lastly, of course, international. We need to work a lot more with our international partners. We have the COP28 in Dubai coming up important milestone as every COP uh, is, but we also need to conclude a lot of win-win partnerships with the Global South uh, because we remain very dependent on imports of energy, of critical raw materials, many other things. So we need to conclude these win-win partnerships with the Global South so that everyone is moving on the ladder of uh, sustainability. And I'll just close by saying that um, we are, as part of our implementation work, also working on the 2040 uh, targets. Um, we will be presenting a communication in early uh, 2024. Um, very important there to have the right investment signal. So we'll do it in a way that it facilitates implementation and investment this decade, because investments take a time horizon that is typically much longer than seven years. Um, 20, 25, uh, 30 years. We'll have to tackle a few difficult issues like agriculture and food, where um, a lot more is needed, but we all realize how difficult that is. So we need to tread very carefully there, but resolutely. Carbon removals will become very high on the agenda. Circular economy. Um, I'm convinced that the next decade will be one of really bringing down to reality the circular economy, a much smarter use of resources and materials in our economy. And lastly, and probably the most difficult of all, is to start influencing consumer behavior. Because we see in our modeling that the more we can um, influence, shift consumer behavior, the less costly will be our transition to climate neutrality by 2050. And that's where I hope partnerships like the green growth partnership can help us in giving the ideas the uh, solutions on how to do this in a way that it actually works and that we don't get into polarized debates and identity politics which would be really detrimental for achieving our ambition well, Kurt, that was, uh, well, thank you for that presentation. Very uh, comprehensive. There's many follow-up questions that I want to uh, put to you after that. But before, let's go uh, to Ursula and let's just get your take on this. I saw you were nodding in, in, in many of the, the statements that he made. Yes. Um, is it working? Okay, here we go. Um, indeed, you know, I, I really appreciated Kurt's wise words, really. I mean, th this point about the long-term predictability for business is, is something that we have really uh, worked on um, for a long time. We really see the need to lay out a compelling vision for where we need to get to, what are the things that we need to get there. And, and then that's how we can mobilize finance. That's how we can mobilize the different businesses. Um, but just to kind of step back, I think, as he said, the Green Growth Group Partnership was founded in um, 2013. I think it was a, a big moment, um, a lot um, stimulated by, by the UK at the time. And the first summit really called for an ambitious post-2020 policy framework. And what we heard from Kurt was a lot of the things that have been done, there has been enormous shifts in the legislation. And I think sometimes we do forget that. We see where we are and, and you know, we forget the enormous changes that have happened. Um, and I and I think we should we should look at that and we should see that what uh, and address what has worked as well in the past, what elements have been successful, um, what have been less successful, and fundamentally um, at CLG Europe, what we see is the need for business and governments to work together to work in this positive ambition loop, where we can, where we can work together on the long term vision. We consider what are the key policies that can unlock the pace and scale that we need to drive the systemic change across sectors, across um, across Europe, across well the, the world, in fact, because I mean most companies are international, and then we 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 work together to to drive that. And um, I mean clearly there is this is no time for complacency at all. It is a very difficult situation right now. It's now the hottest year will likely to be the hottest year that humanity has ever seen. Um, we, we have a very difficult global situation getting more complex by the day as, as we have seen. But what we really have seen as well is that 
if we really put together the vision that supports a competitive Europe, one that f is founded on competitive sustainability, that is guided by the ideals of the, the Green Deal, the, the long-term climate neutrality, and aim to bring in nature as well. I mean, we shouldn't forget this is a really key point. We need to really bring in questions around nature positivity and the environment in the future, that that can really guide action. And it has stood up a lot to, to the big questions of recent times, to the pandemic, to the war in Ukraine. It has really guided action. And I think that's a really key point. And when we look ahead, I think we have to see a couple of points at the international level. How do we really support the phase out of fossil fuels? I think we'll hear a little bit more today from partners here who are working on a fossil to clean campaign at We Mean Business. Um, we'll think about what the impact is of the global stock take. You know, well, how do we, how is it that we get to 1.5? And we'll really think about how to implement um, uh, the different policies that we need to achieve by 2030. And a lot of the work that we have done has really shown the importance of putting the right context in place for 2030 and for other policies. How do you really make it a situation where people and businesses will choose to choose the right uh, clean solutions, choose different elements? And some of the work that we've done has really shown that what you do is you put in place, you make sure you're communicating in the right way from the right communities. You have the right policies at local level. You mobilize finance so that it is not, you know, it is uh, achievable financially for people. And if you do that, and we have a wide variety of best practices to share, and we hope to continue doing so through the Green Growth Partnership, you can really drive the pace um, and acceleration that, that you need to do. And a lot of the businesses that we've been working with and are here in this room today have been putting in place big ambitious targets, have been driving the electrification of their fleets, have been driving the take up of renewable electricity, new technologies, have clear cut targets in place. And I think that really this is the time that we need to all work together to, to achieve this positive ambition loop. I mean, as Kurt says, we don't really have a choice, right? Globally, we are in a competitive situation. There is a climate crisis that is affecting both our lives in Europe, but also globally. It will affect, there'll be risks to the supply chains, there'll be risks for people, there'll be risks from nature. And so what we need to do is tackle this enormous problem. We need to take it by the horns and, and move and go forward to the future. Um, so it's not really a choice, but it, there is a question about how to do it, how to do it well, and how to work in partnership across sectors and um, across the politics. Well, thank you for that. And uh, Kurt, I, I know you're busy and you have to go, so I will ask you multiple uh, questions, hopefully uh, not too many, but to the point. Uh, you said, and given that we're in this uh, business uh, context, that uh, at the beginning, the European Union was criticized for taking all of this action, that you would lose competitiveness. Now you see that the Inflation Reduction Act, they're putting a lot of money to work in the US. You talked about China uh, too. So now it seems that if you're not in this race, you actually risk, well, not just staying behind, but also losing business uh, opportunities. I wonder when it comes to this two-way relationship that you're gonna need, uh, what is the biggest accelerator that you believe could happen in this relationship between the private and the public? What is the biggest impediment at this point? And as a final one, because I know you have to go, so I'm gonna ask you many in a row, is uh, we're in Brussels, you know, everyone is talking about this. Do you believe the European elections, maybe the future commission, a lot of this could change that long-term vision? Good questions. Um, <laughs> I'm also grappling with these questions. Uh, so a few thoughts. Um, first, the big advantage we now have in the EU is that we have established a clear regulatory framework which gives certainty. Uh, so you could simplistically say uh, the US is subsidizing itself to climate neutrality or decarbonization. The EU is regulating itself. Um, and that's a little bit the simplistic difference uh, between the two of us. What we see is that there is a lot of businesses now looking at the US in terms of what the IRA offers them. We have not seen the big exodus of investments or investment leakage that some were fearing but we have to stay very vigilant 
We cannot be complacent. Uh, and we do see signals that European businesses are attracted uh, by the IRA. But you at haven't the, seen the super exodus that people not feared super at the exodus start of the year. So far, not so far. Uh, some have happened. Uh, but many companies now in Europe are sitting on the fence and are trying to see where to make their investment. They're not abandoning Europe. They're really looking at, should we first invest in US and then in Europe, or first in Europe and then in the US? That's a little bit uh, because the capital is limited, right? Uh, so they have to make uh, choices where to go. The big disadvantage that the US has is that there is no guarantee of a market in the future. Because what happens if the administration changes there? Um, what happens if there is no clear policy of phasing out fossil fuel from the system, uh, whereby the prices of fossil fuels of gas, for example, would remain very competitive, more competitive than other green solutions, which would at a certain point in time not have the tax advantages anymore. So that's a clear uncertainty. That's the advantage we have in Europe now, that we provide that regulatory certainty for investors. The problem here is that we do not have for all sectors, for many sectors we have, but we do not have for all sectors a clear business case for investing and decarbonizing here. Um, also because of our high energy prices. The prices will go down at some moment in time in the future, hopefully sooner rather than later. But how do we bridge that period of the next two, three, five years where the energy prices are high? The um, solutions, the technologies for decarbonizing exist. Can I just ask you very quickly there, Kurt, because you make a very good point. Uh, you talked about the energy crisis, and I'm glad you did, because that brings the entire context uh, into perspective. What do you say to those who say, you're pushing ahead with this green revolution in this context of very high, well, not high as the record prices we saw in the summer, but really more than average. It is too much to take on. What do you respond to that? It is tough, but there is no alternative, I think, because we pay high prices because we are very import dependent for fossil fuels. We import 90% or more of our fossil fuels. So we pay a very high price for this fossil fuel dependency. So our only choice, our only option is to invest in a low carbon decarbonized, uh, mostly renewable, but not only based uh, energy system. So that's for the future, our best investment in global competitiveness. But it's that bridging period where we have a difficulty and where we need to work with businesses on having their business case for decarbonizing investments in Europe. And that's exactly what we have now started doing. I just come from uh, the uh, first clean transition uh, dialogue with industry on hydrogen, where we bring together industry across Europe, both demand and supply side, and see how we can really use the scale and scope of the single market and align the funding that is needed, which is in the system already, but very fragmented compared to what the US is offering. If we can align this and make it an attractive proposition for businesses to invest here, then we can really make uh, a positive difference. Um, so, and that's especially the case, I think, for energy intensive industries, which are, of course, faced with these high prices. If you ask me what will happen after the next elections, next commission, much will depend on the outcome of the elections, of course, and who will be the president of the European Commission. Um, but I do think um, that the ambition that we have set in law now for climate will not be questioned anymore. The cost-effective manner of how to achieve that, that is, as Ursula was also saying, a matter for debate. And that will be with us for many years to come. But I don't feel from any national administration, for example, um, a willingness to put everything into question. They are overwhelmed, national administrations, businesses are overwhelmed, but no one is questioning the direction and the ambition. It's more how we do it rather than if we do it. And Ursula, do you want to have a final word? Thank you. I think Kurt said most of the things I would have replied, so that that's great. And I, I really think that is so critical. We are, we need to go in this direction. And I think that any delays now, it just makes it more complicated and more expensive to do it. So it's really about how we do this quickly, 
bringing people along, however, talking to local communities, talking to businesses, seeing what the best paths forwards are. And um, so we certainly, for example, are supporting the discussion around the 2040 target. Um, we came out with this position of at least 90% by 2040, because I think it's really important to set the, set the ambition and then look at the pathways, look at the ways we can drive investment, as you say. How can we drive investment into the clean technologies we need? How can we drive investment into the communities? Bring the skills as well. Skills is a huge um, an issue in the future. How do we um, make sure that we have the right jobs, uh, decent jobs, the right skills um, to enable the, the future that, that we, we are aiming for here, which is a, should be a prosperous one, a climate negative, a neutral one and a nature positive one. And as you say, once you put the date, then it's not about when, but how do you get uh, to that date? There's a pressure of the deadlines, of course. Well, a round of applause to the two of them. Thank you so much for setting the scene for us. Uh, wonderful to see you both. And uh, before we continue, however, we also uh, move on to our next uh, panel. We have a video from uh, Austria's uh, climate minister. Her name is Leonor Gavisler, and uh, she couldn't be here uh, in person, but she did leave a message that I want you to see. So let's play the message. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be delivering this welcome statement to this year's summit on the occasion of celebrating 10 years of the Green Growth Partnership. The Green Growth Partnership is a very unique and a very special forum of exchange among policymakers and businesses that are united in their progressive attitude to the most pressing issues of our time. And without a doubt, one of the most pressing issues and the most challenging issues of our generation is the climate crisis. This past July and August were the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. We witnessed extreme temperatures, heat waves, wildfires, flooding. This is our new reality, our new normal, as we stand at around 1.2 degrees of global heating. And this is only the beginning if we don't manage to turn around. So what makes me confident that we can actually turn the wheel around? 10 years ago, at the start of the Green Growth Partnership, the world was quite different. There was no Paris Agreement. There were no NDCs. There was no Green Deal. There were no concrete plans for phasing out fossil fuels. In the past five years alone, we have adopted a European climate law, a new European adaptation strategy, a strengthening of member states' effort sharing, an extension of the EU emissions trading scheme, including a social climate fund, stringent emission standards for new cars, as well as important legislation on renewable energy, on energy efficiency, and on energy security to name just a few. We are today in a very different Europe and a very different world than we were in 2013. Does that mean we're all set? No, obviously not. Delivering on the Paris Agreement means we need to recognize that the marathon of transformation has only just begun. The first global stock take at the UN Climate Conference this year will therefore be key. And I'm hopeful that it will send strong signals around the world for this critical decade up to 2030. And also beyond the current mandate of the Commission, we must take the next steps to close remaining gaps and set our sights on 2040 by delivering on a Green Deal 2.0 for the next Commission mandate. And let me add one thing in this group of like-minded friends. Independent of who we vote for in the next elections, European or national, let us work together to prevent that the climate discourse is being hijacked by populists. Those populists who stir up uncertainty by distorting facts and sometimes even blunt lies. Those populists who will never deliver on solutions because their political momentum feeds of exacerbating problems. Those populists who want to profit from the uncertainty that they created. We must stand together and offer concrete solutions and hope to the people in Europe and the world and work for a just transition that actually delivers on leaving no one behind. There's much to do, and it can be done if we work on this together. It is in this spirit that I say, here's to the next 10 years. I wish you all a very exciting meeting.
will introduce uh, them to the panelists. And then on that, that note, I want to bring in uh, our next panelist, which is, if I may perhaps call her name, is Professor, uh, well, Laura Diaz Anadon. If you want to maybe sit closer to me and then we're good. And I have a, an exciting presentation to come. I want to see it. We're also joined uh, remotely by Berhard Goitke. He is representing uh, the German uh, Ministry for Climate Action and Economic Affairs. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us uh, today in person, but uh, Mr. Goitke, if you hear us, then turn on your camera and uh, the sound. Uh, you'll be the second uh, panelist. Uh, joining us in person, we have the Ambassador uh, Pierre Cartuvel, who's here you're representing, uh, well, the Belgian uh, government. You're going to have a lot of homework based on what Kurt said uh, next year. So uh, it's good to get started. Uh, joining us uh, also online, we have uh, Rafael Mateo, who is the CEO of Acciona, a uh, big Spanish company. Uh, we also have Villan Inisto, who is an MEP for the Greens. And then last but not least, uh, Megan, I know want to go on stage or joined by Megan Mitrovsky dale who is uh, director for the environmental sustainability at Coca-Cola uh, Euro-Pacific Partners. And I believe now if everyone who is connected online is connected and has their camera on, then we should be good uh, to go. So the name of the panel is the stepping stones to 2040, the road ahead uh, for those targets. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Professor Diaz because there's a reason behind this number, and it's not uh, just out of the blue, random uh, target. I know you worked on the studies behind the reasons for it, so I wonder with the presentation that I know you've brought along, if you could explain how you see things now from here to there and what's the rationale behind it. And of course, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Maria, and thank you to the uh, uh, Green Growth Partnership for inviting me. Um, I think we have the slides uh, here, just two, not, not more. Um, I'll take you through um, the process that we went through in the European uh, Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change, which was created by the EU Climate Law in 2021, which the, our, um, the commissioner uh, mentioned. And I'll take you through the process. And I want you to leave with, I, I guess, three key messages. Um, the, thir the first one, if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, yes. That's the pointer. Oh, great. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You can't escape them. I actually don't really need the slides, but um, <laughs> not doing it. I'll just start because I know we're, yeah. No, no. No, uh, it's okay. So, okay, we so we were tasked uh, with uh, providing input to what the 2040 target might be, and we conducted an analysis. The first thing that I wanted to say, great, is that the starting point for this analysis was uh, were two things. First of all, the climate neutrality objective by 2050. So that was the starting point. And the other starting point was, of course, the 1.5 ambition of the Paris Agreement. So those were the two things that really started our whole analysis. It's worth mentioning that, of course, the 1.5 uh, target, Paris target, was reaffirmed in both Glasgow in 2021 and in Sharm el Sheikh in 2022. Then if you, look, if you see the slide, what we see is that there are two big parts of our analysis that were initially done separately. The first one is this feasible pathway consideration. So what we did in the advisory board is that we collected over 1,000 scenarios, both from the IPCC, the most recent IPCC uh, Working Group 3 report, but also newer scenarios that reflected some of the inertia in the climate system. So we had over 1,000 scenarios, and we basically filtered them, first of all, uh, to make sure that they were consistent with the 1.5 target, again, as per our starting point, um, and also consistent with the 2050 European uh, climate, climate neutrality. So we started with uh, those two things, and then we conducted a set of feasibility checks. So some of the feasibility checks we have here on the slide, but I think you cannot see it. So we, we try to... Um, uh, consider the feasibility uh, of scenarios if we wanted to avoid very high levels of biomass. And uh, this is all, again, of course, based on the scientific literature. 
a very large scale deployment of carbon capture and storage and utilization. Um, potentially unrealistic levels of uh, carbon removals on land. And as we all know, uh, uh, the land sink has been decreasing um, uh, in the EU. And also we wanted to uh, consider uh, the fact that very sharp reductions in energy demand might be very difficult and not very feasible from a social cultural um, perspective. I should note that all of the scenarios that are consistent with the climate neutrality target and also with the target that we came up with have some version of these things. So it's not that we didn't include any of these things, but we tried to avoid unrealistic levels or unrealistic contributions of, again, biomass, CCUS, uh, CDR on land, and very, very large changes on energy demand. So that's the first piece on the uh, feasible pathway. The second piece that we did is this, um, and, and I should note, the other feasibility analysis that we conducted was on the pace of scale up of uh, renewables, as well as on the pace of scale up of hydrogen. And again, if you're interested, we have all of the, we have all of the thresholds and all of the justifications and, and references. The second piece is on the right-hand side, and it's this analysis of the fair share. So here we looked at again, again at the literature, the IPCC, and as you may know, there is a large literature on feasible way or on, on fair ways of allocating the remaining um, carbon budget. So there are different principles. There's polluter pays, equal per capita, historical emissions, and all of those principles are equally valid in the sense that they are supported by the literature. And what we did is that we calculated all of those for the EU. This is a very important topic, first of all, again, because there's a literature, but of course, um, because it was very important to uh, lay out what are the different approaches, because it's really a value judgment, which uh, to decide which of those one uses. So having done all of that, if we go to the next slide, uh, the second point, uh, you know, besides the starting point of the 1.5, is really that when considering those two pieces, we ended up with a set of pathways uh, that led us to come up with a recommendation to, uh, to have a target of, uh, for 2040 of 90% reductions over 1990 at least, and up to 95%. We say up to 95% because when you get to the 95%, you end up running into some of these big ecological risks we end up bumping very strongly against some of these feasibility thresholds that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the other piece of this advice, again, the, the second key message is really uh, that in addition to these targets, it's very important that the EU also pursues external action outside of the EU to reduce emissions outside of the EU, as well as pursuit of carbon dioxide removal. The reason for this is that even when looking at these things, there's still a gap between the feasible and the fair, no matter what fairness principle one, uh, one chooses, so to speak. So that's the second point. Uh, on this figure, what we can see is that the green line, uh, the green bar is really one that shows that actually the 55% target by 2030, that again was mentioned, mentioned by uh, Kurt van der Wege, is very much online, is consistent with the 2040 target. So that's one of the key messages that we also have in this advice. It's kind of on the upper end of this, but it is uh, largely consistent with it. And then uh, the green bar is the one that really um, it's safer in terms of some of these uh, ecological uh, impacts in terms of land uses. Just two things on these scenarios. So again, uh, we have three iconic pathways that we lay out. It doesn't mean that they cover every possibility, but there are a few common features of some of these scenarios that are consistent with the 2050 and the recommended 2040 target. Uh, the first one is at the carbonized power sector by 2040. Again, that's something that was discussed just previously. The second one, all of them have uh, lower energy demand. Some of it is because when you electrify, you become more efficient. Some of it is in some scenarios reduction in demand. And in some of them, we have uh, some changes in lifestyles, which again was one of the areas that uh, uh, Kurt van der Regen mentioned as one of the uh, key challenges. Uh, we also have, again, a key feature is reducing non-CO2 emissions from agriculture and waste. That's another uh, common feature in all of the scenarios consistent with the target. Scale up of carbon uh, removal, again, uh, different extents uh, in different scenarios, and also a scale up of hydrogen, although mainly for uh, aviation, maritime, and, and heavy fuels. 
Finally, the last message, if I still have a second, um, that I uh, wanted to mention is that we also highlight in this analysis what are some of the benefits of climate action. Uh, and the ones that we really highlight from the analysis that we conducted as part of this uh, report were really uh, some of the avoiding uh, locking of fossil fuel assets, also improved energy security, and also um, the health and lower pollution benefits of the transition. They're not the only um, benefits. We have sections where we talk a little bit on the literature and some of the economics and competitiveness benefits, but we really highlight that almost the, the sooner we move down, we avoid cumulative emissions, but also um, get some of these benefits early. Um, with that, the, the last uh, thing is that um, the key challenges going forward to make this happen are, of course, on the ensuring uh, that um, policy decisions bring everybody along, as Ursula was saying earlier, and that they consider some of the distributional uh, and competitiveness issues associated with uh, continuing down that path. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we um, continue with the rest of panelists, I was very um, struck because I kept hearing this in your presentation, you repeated uh, many times, it's got to be fair and, and feasibility. Is that the crux of, of the tension in this argument? Do you have to look at both? Yes. So that was the key thing that we wrestled with. How were we going to uh, come up with something that was feasible, given what we know about the momentum in the infrastructure, in emissions, about the budget, uh, without really hurting uh, in a major way, uh, you know, ecosystems, as I mentioned, um, but also fairness. There's a huge literature on this from, you know, legal, uh, you know, philosophy and from various other principles. And what we found when we did those two pieces of the analysis that almost no matter how you did it, there was always a little bit of a gap in between. So it was looking for something that was as fair as possible while still being feasible. And that's why we have those additional recommendations. And, and just a final point on this, but I think it's very important. Is it fair and feasible across the European Union? Yes. Uh, so our analysis of fairness was looking at the role of the EU versus the rest of the world. So we looked at that fairness dimension, but, that, but there are also other very important fairness considerations in terms of intra-EU fairness, and that is not part of the analysis that we conducted. But we do discuss that this is one of the important areas uh, that when we are thinking about policy design to meet potentially this target and also the carbon neutrality target is essential. So we did not look at that. Super important. And now uh, let's go to Germany, obviously uh, connected online. I wish we could teleport, but that's not the case yet. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Wittke, thank you so much. Uh, you're representing the German federal government. Uh, some people see that Germany finds itself facing the biggest challenge of all in the European Union. Others say this is the biggest opportunity. Obviously, you know you're a big economy, you have the resources, uh, also the political will to some extent too in the coalition, but also you're a very heavily industrialized country that depends now on industries that definitely have become well more expensive. How do you combine the two to get to this target in 2040? Is it doable? Oh, thank you well, very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Tadeo. Firstly, uh, and uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, a good afternoon to all of you uh, from Berlin. And uh, perhaps you give me the chance to, to thank uh, the Corporate Leaders Group for organizing this uh, timely event and congratu congratulate you and us for 10 years of, of fruitful cooperation uh, in the Green Growth Partnership. As previous speakers also have pointed out, a lot of has been achieved in these past uh, years, 10 years ago, the price of the ETS certificate was well below 10 euros. Germany did not have a phase out date for coal and uh, we had neither a Paris agreement uh, nor a European climate law providing for EU climate neutrality target for 2050. So uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, we have uh, come a long, uh, a long way in the last years, most notably the adoption of the biggest chunk of the legislative files of the Fit for 55 package in a challenging time of multiple crises is a historic milestone. I think there's not an exaggeration, but that is a, a realistic description of what we have achieved. Uh, Fit for 55 underlines that fossil energies will no longer be the basis for the economy. In addition, it highlights that uh, renewable energies are also freedom energies. I think that is also important to point out in those days, uh, rendering the EU independent from Russian fossil fuels. However, there is uh, still some unfinished business and uh, 
Uh, we need to conclude the remaining Fit for 55 trilogue negotiations swiftly. A high level of uh, ambition in clim EU climate and energy files will also help us to achieve our own ambitious, ambitious domestic climate targets in Germany. So uh, implementation is the order of the day. Implementing ambitious targets into efficient, socially fair and effective measures that will uh, guide investments, ensure planning security for businesses and very importantly, make a just transition possible that the, all these elements will be key. It is as challenging as it is necessary in a time of increased international competition and also geopolitical insecu insecurity and anti-democratic movements on the rise. Climate targets and policies are just about are not just about climate, they are at the heart of solving many of the EU's strategic challenges. And this brings me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the next uh, uh, phase of transformation. At the same time as implementing the Fit for 55 package, uh, we must also look ahead to the next phase of the transition. The global stock take under the Paris Agreement will undoubtedly show that the world is not on track to achieve the 1.5 degrees limit. We welcome the Commission's Advisory Board's scientific guidance for the new EU climate target for 2040 in this context. The new climate target is about designing the next phase of the transition as we get closer to net zero emissions. Firstly, dear colleagues, uh, we all know that the last reduction towards net zero will be the most expensive ones as we are then talking about hard to abate emissions. We must pick the more low hanging fruit first and in good time as the clock is ticking. Secondly, we see the deployment of renewables accelerate in the European Union. They are now rightly recognized as a stable asset regarding cost, tra cost trends, ensuring our independence from autocratic systems. We should use this opportunity uh, really. Thirdly, the 2040 target must be part of our response to the challenge of global competitiveness. We must, take, we must make sure we do not lose out on the race to competitiveness in net zero technologies and industries. We do not believe in a global subsidy race, but should try to win business investments with the outlook of a clear and reliable framework geared, to, geared towards net zero economy. All these reasons, the climate crisis, cost efficiency, energy security, and the global race to net zero make a strong case for deviating from a linear pathway towards net zero. I also take note and welcome that businesses organized in the corporate leaders group are calling for an ambitious 2040 target. To be frank, Germany does not have a position on the new target level yet. Um, however, because we addressed at the beginning of the discussion, however, we do have a nationally binding reduction target of 88% for 2040, which together with SINGS brings us to about 91%. Of course, we have this in mind when we join the discussion on the EU, EU target. Ladies and gentlemen, apart from the target level, the target design will also be important. Removal of CO2 and its storage, both in biogenic and techni technical sinks, must be an indispensable part of the discussion for 2040. However, we must be quite clear, reducing emissions has to remain our top priority. We believe that our natural sinks are threatened by climate change and we see large energy and spatial needs when it comes to technological carbon removals which need to be addressed. Therefore, it would be wise to have separate targets for reducing carbon emissions for increasing our natural sinks and for scaling up technological removals. This will, will also create 
a clear planning horizon for business and prevent lock-in effects for the use of fossil fuels in carbon-intensive business models. We still have big challenges ahead. In many sectors, the instruments are there, such as the directives for renewables and for efficiency, but uh, will need to be updated. In some other sectors, for instance, agriculture, we will need to add to the policy toolbox to tackle these emissions. In this context, uh, we look forward to the new commission coming forward with a fit for net zero package once the new target is agreed. In our view, this should build on the current legislative approach with elements of national responsibility and strong European measures in all sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, to sum up, we have achieved a lot. We need to get implementation done and smartly design the remaining miles on the road to net zero. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the presentation. I just had a very um, quick follow-up question because given that we're not in Germany, but you are uh, obviously working in the German uh, ministry, and this is an important ministry, by the way, in the, in the coalition. I wonder, however, if you could explain to us, just to get a better sense, what is the mood when it comes to this issue in the German society, I wonder too, in the German industry is very powerful, uh, in the past has been critical of some measures. What is the mood now? What kind of understanding do you have from the business community? And is there anything that they ask out of you and, and European legislation at a moment of such big changes? Well, I think um, we have just uh, also uh, presented and adopted a new climate uh, program for Germany, uh, where we uh, defined the measures how to achieve our 2030 targets. And uh, we've uh, got a lot of uh, positive response to this. And uh, uh, what has been stated in the discussion here in uh, this afternoon already can also be observed in my country. Industry and society, they are prepared to move forward to uh, more ambitious targets. But uh, what they need is a pre predictability and, and a clear pathway how we can achieve this. And that is, will be, I think, the, uh, the discussion in the upcoming months and weeks, uh, weeks and months, how we can uh, further develop uh, the pathway after 2030, in which way we have already the targets in our uh, German national law for climate action, as I uh, refer to, 88 percent by 2040. So our society is prepared to go the way in this direction, but uh, we uh, also have to discuss uh, the, the concrete measures, especially for the path after 2030. Well, thank you for that, and we'll go uh, into that in in a second but before uh to say we talked about uh next year you also mentioned the communications that the commu the commission is expected to put out and that would fall on the belgian uh presidency rotating presidency of the european union so uh you know ambassador are you are you ready for it are you are you excited are you looking forward to working on it or do you go uh you know we better get going already thank you for having me me here, you hear me? Yeah. Um, I tend to say to everybody these last days that we are ready, already now. So to take over from 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 Spain, but um, I think they are doing a terrific job. So so I'm happy to to wait a little bit more. Um, I think a lot has been said already. Um, obviously, as an incoming presidency, at, a, at the end of a legislature, we will have the um, difficult task to, I would say, introduce this uh, issue. Because as we, we heard from the, the commission, the proposals or the communication will come in January. We start in January. Um, and maybe a legal proposal will be tabled during our presidency because I think it's six months after the stock taking that this should be done. 
um, uh, in, in the framework of the, the, the climate law. So we expect, of course, to have maybe a legal proposal, but anyway, we know that we will have the discussions launched with this communication. And, and uh, so we prepare to, to organize the discussions as an honest broker, I would say. Um, and um, we expect the discussions not to be easy because the the situation obviously is what it is i think um you you ended with words like feasibility uh, just uh, transition uh, there was a word said about implementation uh, in germany of and in all our countries we are now implementing a lot that has been decided during the past uh, legislature so Doing all this together is really a challenge. And having serene discussions in a pre-electoral um, situation is also a challenge. So we are, we are, we are ready for that because we, we are convinced that uh, we need to take the further steps uh, in the transition. Um, but it, will, uh, it, it is not an easy task. Um, I would say, I think the, the, the drivers in this have been already said around this table. Um, much is about feasibility and, and, and just, it is, we have to implement huge, um, huge things. If you think about uh, housing, for instance, the, the, the um, efficiency directive the energy efficiency directive this will cost uh, enormous amounts of money to our households uh, if you take all the other measures that are to be taken now uh, it needs a lot of infrastructure a public infrastructure uh, but also a lot of investments in our industry and so um, Money is necessary, and I'm not sure when we compare to other parts of the world. Yes, uh, I fully agree. The uh, the Green Deal is a growth strategy. It's conceived as a growth strategy. Um, is something which which will which will bring together our transition and our economy and the social acceptability, but the uh, the amounts of money that are needed by public by private sector are so big uh, that uh, it's it's really uh, not easy. We when you compare to um, the United States to China. Um, it's also always difficult, I think, to do that because when Europe is not comparable. Um, as such, we have the European Union. You can't compare the budget of the European Union to the national budgets of the United States or, or China. So we need our member states and uh, the budgets of our member states. And that's what's happening. Uh, if you compare what the member states are putting in it and our households and our industries, then you reach uh, amounts that may be get to what happens elsewhere. But it asks a lot uh, of effort. So um, I think we will have uh, a difficult period ahead. Um, also uh, with the elections, I, I, I think populism has been cited. Um, it, it's, it's not only populism that is a danger. I think we need to explain what we are doing and what is needed. And so there is a huge task for our, um, our parliamentarians, uh, our, our public figures, uh, for a presidency to try to convince uh, the people ahead of the elections. And uh, you, you made very good points. And later, perhaps we get into more of a political discussion. You mentioned, um, a topic, an issue that comes up repeatedly, which is if you have all of those big ambitions, you need the money to back it up. Otherwise, it seems like, forgive the expression, but it's a lot of pie in the sky. It's difficult to sell and it's not feasible. So I wonder, do you believe, again, going back to your presidency, that there's also going to be inevitably a discussion about is the European budget 
fit for purpose. I mean, you've talked about so many different things. I mean, climate is just one aspect. I mean, do you think they go in conjunction? I think, again, a, a lot has been done. I think these last years um, and the consciousness that it takes a lot of money is there. And only the the... The, the, the three letters IRA have been used by everybody to 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 put it in uh, to, to to make it clear, and so a lot of, is going on. Um, a lot of instruments uh, are being proposed also by by the Commission. Um, these instruments, with all respect, are not enough. What we get now is not enough. It's it's an effort. I, I, I think you all know the step uh, or um, even uh, the the electricity reform, the, mar the, the, the electricity market reform is also with a purpose of um, making this transition easier. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, different aspects of our policies have been triggered to 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 bring some more money in the system for the transition so this is really good but um well uh, the next uh, commission will have the revision of the mff maybe this is something uh, more interesting because we need fundamental efforts more efforts than actually i see for the moment it's a very interesting point because you hear this repeatedly and not just this issue, but many other discussions that ultimately will take uh, much more. Uh, I wanna go back to Germany because to some extent, you know, money, Germany at times is not a problem. So uh, this transition, however, will require from the German government, uh, well, a lot of political consensus. I wonder if you still believe that is the case. Some say it has been tarnished over the past uh, year, and you see that reflected in some of the polls. Uh, and at the same time, you're going to have to work very closely uh, with some of your industries, which at this time, they also seem to be struggling. So I wonder, uh, Mr. Wedke, what is the maybe long-term optimistic case for the German economy as you look to 2040, because the situation may be difficult now, but we're talking about 15 years down the line. In your view, what is the optimistic take on things in the next 15 years, which if you do what you say you want to do, is going to be a huge transformation for this economy? Yes, he can. <laughs> and I think you're muted. We, we thought you. it was a difficult Wait question. Some, didn't want to answer it. <laughs> we had some problems with the, uh, uh, with the muting. But, um, well, yes, uh, firstly, let me say that uh, on the one hand, uh, the German government uh, uh, invests a lot of money. Uh, the revenues from the European uh, trading system uh, are used in order to bring uh, the national the important changes in industry uh, uh, to, to well, give incentives for these uh, changes uh, with regard to decarbonizing industry, for example. Uh, we have uh, already also the in, um, special rules concerning uh, the transition of the energy system. You know that we want to achieve 65% uh, of electricity and renewables in 2030. And so um, in our perspective, uh, um, we, and we can see that also the increase of the uh, ETS uh, and the growing role of the ETS in the next years will uh, show that uh, investing in climate-friendly uh, techno no technologies will be uh, uh, well fruitful for the for, for the companies. And therefore, um, we uh, also have the, the the key problem that we have is to find uh, the, to bridge in the next three, four, five years the energy the costs energy costs for energy inten intensive industries, but um, when uh, we will have lower costs for energy uh, uh, production, energy, energy consumption, together with the incentives that we give uh, in our uh, transitional uh, climate and traditional funds uh, to the companies, uh, we are um, quite optimistic that uh, in the upcoming years, and especially in the 30s, we will have these technological um, steps forward in order to be able to achieve 
uh, is at least the target that we have uh, in Germany already since 2021 for 2040. And uh, this will be, I think, a very important contribution uh, to uh, uh, the European target for 2040, but also a very important contribution to uh, the, the, of our um, German um, economy to the European economy on the way of decarbonizing uh, the uh, always all kinds of production. That's very interesting. So you say, if I understood it correctly, it's going to take a, a, a three to four year transition, but the b benefits would be obvious by by 2030. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. That is, our, that is our prediction. Again, it's talking about this idea of a timeline. We're going to go to the second part of the panel, but before, uh, is there anyone who has uh, any questions from the audience who wants to uh, put them to our speakers? This is the time uh, to do it. If not, I can continue on and on. Well, let's go to the, don't be shy, it's good to, to, to uh, do the questions. So maybe for the second part. Uh, and again, as I said, now we're going to move into our second uh, uh, part. Uh, as I said before, we are joined also by the CEO of uh, Axiona. Uh, Megan from uh, Coca-Cola is also uh, here. And um, we're also joined by the MEP Ninista, who I missed you at the start because you were on your way. So I rushed you a little bit, uh, but now you're here. Um, and in fact, now let me put the first question uh, to you. In fact, uh, we talked about the potential new commission, the new parliamentary elections, uh, maybe the mood and the public changing, or, or maybe not. Uh, I wonder, however, because I've thought about this question a lot. Uh, this summer, it was obvious that uh, there are climate episodes that are not uh, normal. If you want to have proof of some of these uh, major issues that we talk about, you literally had them in front of your eyes in, in July and August. But I was surprised that on a European level, we didn't really see a pickup for the Greens uh, in a lot of national polls. How do you change that? And what explains that? Because to me, it was the most curious thing out of this. Or could it be that now you don't just represent climate, that everyone has jumped on the cost, maybe? Unfortunately not. <laughs> so yeah, um, do you want me to answer to that or, or make my broader comments to start with? Make your introduction remarks and hopefully yeah. an answer too. Yeah, well, I think we are at the phase uh, in in uh, in uh, the development of our societies and, and the progress of, of, of climate change where uh, there are kind of like, it's very clear from the scientific viewpoint that we are already living in an age of, of uh, uh, climate and environmental instability. So the times that we have been used to are past, uh, yeah, they are, they are in, in, in history, and people take different uh, strategies to, to react to this change. And a lot of it is, is still den denial. It's about um, uh, uh, trying to, you know, reconnect with, you know, hoping that we can continue with the, the uh, economic uh, models that we had in the 90s or early 2000s. And, uh, and uh, the right answer for politicians is not to write the wave and and try to uh, try to support those feelings the right answer is to try as politicians to be responsible and and show people that progress can be possible at this time and age as well and that progress will deliver better jobs better living standards better environment for us but we need to change a lot the change we, that is facing us in the next 10 to 15 years is uh, on the scale of the industrial revolution and it's a lot faster than at that time. So this is what we have to realize. And it's not just the green change, but it's also the digital change. Um, let me start by saying also, when I was um, Minister of the Environment for Finland 10 years ago, when this Green Growth Partnership was formed, um, uh, it was actually in, in the Ministerial Council, Ed Davey was very active in this, the British minister at that time. I hope the UK government is still <laughs> very progressive in their climate policies as, as they were 10 years back, we, because in this cooperation, we will definitely need them. Uh, but at that time, when Finland joined also the coalition, I was pushing for 55% emission reductions for 2030 at EU level. And colleagues in our cabinet, uh, other ministers in, in my own government said that, Villa, you are crazy. You are driving jobs and, and, and the industry is away from Finland and how you can do that. And you can't say aloud these things because it will you know, make investors uncertain. 
just you know think about the change of narrative in the last 10 years now the business community in finland is pushing for higher ambition than politicians in general uh, we have a uh, major investment coming to finland uh, on an industrial uh, industrial investments that are larger than we've had since 1950s uh, if you compare the size of the gdp so uh, the, the business community investors uh, are seeing that the economic paradigm is shifting and and this shift in the last 10 years is already so big that if you think 15 20 years ahead i think we can achieve a lot more than many politicians and many people understand nowadays and the the real problem for me is no longer business communities or, or investors or innovation. I think we have the technologies and the capabilities to be carbon neutral more or less within 10 years, actually, if we would have just a, a, a political capability to create a systemic shift. We are lacking that political capability. So the problem are the politicians and politicians react to pressure from, from citizens and the citizens feel worried. If they are worried, a lot of the citizens will easily turn to populists who say that we don't need to do that. We let's just, you know, go back to what we had 10 years ago and I will protect uh, that for you. Let me tell how that happened. We have beet industry in Finland, which is we used to be a big industry. Um, not big uh, on an international level, but 5% of uh, Finnish uh, energy consumption. Uh, this beet industry in the early 2010s uh, was already looking like something that when the ETS prices are going up, we knew that as they create emissions at uh, the level of, 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 of coal, that this will be uh, economically non-viable in the 2020s. How many politicians said that, that this will happen? I think I was the only one. As a minister of the environment, I was saying we should not invest into peat anymore because this will be lost money. The investors will lose their money in 10 years. This will not be viable. The smart thing to do is to start to uh, scale it down uh, now uh, with a progressive plan and invest in sustainable renewables instead. What did the other politicians do? Those who say they protected those jobs, they said that we will promise that the peat industry will go forever on and, and invest more, invest more. And what happened in the late 20? Uh, tens, uh, so 2019, there was a huge disaster in the peat industry because of the rise in the ETS price. All investment in the last 10 years totally lost. The investors and the owners of the companies were angry at politicians who promised that this will be, be um, viable in the future. They made all those investors in the 2010s when we all knew that it was ridiculous. And why did they do that? Because politicians promised that we will protect you. And who they blame? Well, they blame those politicians as well, but they turn into populists who promise we will protect you even more. Uh, this is the, the narrative problem that we have, that, that politicians need to be brave enough to tell that to protect the jobs that are important for you, we need to have this transition. We, we need to make it in a way where we create you economic livelihoods in the countryside, in the rural regions, in agriculture, in forestry, in all sectors. There is no brown sector, no green sector. Everything can become green. We just need to create a paradigm shift where you are on board in this transition to protect your jobs. And, and uh, this is where the politicians are lacking courage. Usually the ministerial council, I, I know that the Belgian uh, um, presidency has a difficult task ahead but usually the ministerial councils are, are functioning in a way where everybody goes to protect their own served interests so so germany protects coal a bit more than needed uh East, eastern european countries are, are protecting something of their own like gas or oil um uh, uh, estonia is protecting oil as well finland was protecting peat in the past the nordics are protecting forest industry even in scientific terms in a way where carbon things are going down. Uh, I think we all need to stop that and we need to look at the common interest in creating rules where the marketplace will be progressive for all sectors. So new innovation will create bioeconomy that is more sustainable, that can create long term jobs and that we stop protecting uh, production methods and consumption methods that we know are lacking sustainability already in the next few years. And there is no government in Europe who has 100% record on being honest about this. I know that, you know, Finland is not that, Germany is not that, sorry, my German Greens were friends, but nobody else is that either. So we all need to try to come together to try to find the, the maximum common nominator, the maximum outcome and not the minimum outcome when we negotiate with each other. 
Uh, so when it comes to 2040 targets, I think the key is to realize, and I think the corporate leaders are realizing it already. Many of the progressive corporate leaders are saying that we should look at at least 90% emission reductions in order to have a 2040 target to start with that will hold, that we don't, you know, do as we did in 2013. When I proposed 55%, the others you know, said that that's too much, we'll go for 40, and we ended up in 55 in, in, in 10 years later, which means uh, less good planning, less, uh, you know, foresight, less uh, uh, economic uh, incentives and less market-based solutions and kind of like reacting to what happens and doing wrong things in the beginning, like like the beat industry stuff I mentioned. And, uh, and uh, that means that the 2040 target should be scientific to start with, it has to be about a circular economy approach. So we have to realize that we can't try to greenwash mining industry and say that, oh, now we are just creating these new car batteries and we just continue vir using virgin resources like we did in the past. Also recycling, uh, resource efficiency, material efficiency, consum consuming different things in a more sustainable way, more digitally. Uh, we have to change the way mobility works. We have to change the way how living works. We have to change the way how warming works. So we just don't change the thing that goes into the energy system, to the pipeline, the, 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 the actual fuel. We change the whole whole way our economy works. I know this is difficult, but the, 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 the gains are huge because that means that we will be digital leaders, European companies will be digital leaders if our public procurement, our communities, our municipalities will turn into digitalization. Uh, we will save a lot of money when we turn into LED lights in our communities and so on. So I think the key is to make this uh, a transition that thinks about carbon sinks, agriculture, forestry. So we have to create a paradigm where it's economically viable in the marketplace to increase the sinks. We have to make this about circular economy. And then we have to do this also in the traditional way as emission reductions. Uh, the greens are pushing for 100%. I think it's possible if we increase sinks as well. 90% is the minimum to, to start the discussions with. And I'm happy that Sefcovic and Hextra actually promised that they are looking at something like a scientific place at, le at least 90% in the, this commission's preparation for the next commission's target. I think that's a good start because the hearing in the parliament made them give this pledge and I think that that's a good start for the discussion. Thanks. Now they feel the heat, that's for sure. There's a question for you, but I will put it after because uh, you said in your presentation, we need to also hear from the business community and the corporate side of things uh, to get to that milestone. Luckily, we have two uh, voices in this uh, panel. Before, uh, l let's go first to Madrid, though, for a second, uh, where we're joined by the CEO of uh, Acciona. He's called uh, Rafael Mateo Alcalá. This is a huge Spanish uh, company in the sector. And I wonder, sir, uh, based on everything that you heard, uh, the big plans, but also the idea that you need to work with the, the public and the government and your own plans. How do you see this overall from a corporate perspective as a company stepping into 2040? Hey, good afternoon. Can you hear me and see me? Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to start my intervention by thanking the CLG and the Cambridge University, not only for this invitation, but also for the for the needs and the proposals uh, in the report regarding the increased ambition in terms of emission reduction for the European Union, which, which we are fully agree. The debate surrounding the 2040 targets presents the European Union a unique opportunity to demonstrate to the businesses and to the citizens and to the world that the climate action is not only the priority, but it will remain at the heart of our political agenda for the next decades. Our future depends on the decisions in terms of energy transition that we make today. And there is no more pressing concern that, uh, that we need to transform the energy sector. This emphasis on sustainability represents not only an environmental imperative for all of us, but also an opportunity for innovation and for economic growth. In Europe, we are still in, continue to dwell on an important criticality. We are still depending on fossil fuels. We are addict, we have dependency, and we don't have fossil fuels. And we are 
Even we are escalating our consumption of fossil fuels. In 2022, it's paradoxical, but uh, the, the imports amount almost 5% of the European GDP. And for many reasons, in 2023, the European Union imported record volumes of LNG coming from Russia. So this dependence is the origin of the ongoing energy crisis together with the obvious effects of the climate change. But both together, they have generated an unprecedented social and political momentum. And we need to do something urgent as a sector, as the corporate, in order to make a fast energy transition. And we need to do the transition, leaving definitively from the, this kind of energy fossil resources. This began uh, with making wrong decisions, basing the transition in a combustible, in a fossil fuel that we didn't have. Uh, a wrong decision to phase out the consumption of fossil fuels. And there, from our point of view, there are two approaches to the, the change of the patterns. One is a regulatory obligation, and second is to create a favorable economics and both have complementary economical signals and obligations, setting in a specific timeline to stop the investment and consumption of fossil fuels and establishing a market environment with a carbon pricing, higher carbon pricing in every sector as the main tool to create the demand and to avoid the use of, fuel, of fossil fuels. It may appear uh, in the short term against the consumers, but in the long term, it pays so The European Central Bank published recently a very interesting report on Let's stop for a second because I don't think we can. If, if, sir, if you could just for a second while we fix the, the image, that would be great. Just just one second. The renewable sector has been facing many regulatory and financial challenges in the recent times, which uh, have emphasized the importance of aligning the ambitions in the environmental targets with a very attractive target uh, opportunities in terms of business. It's necessary the importance of explaining to the society the energy transition in terms of the energy transition is creating local wealth, fostering new industries, and generating high quality employment opportunities. To achieve that, it's imperative that the workforce in Europe is prepared Europe should start working on the net zero academy if we want to be successful implementing all the initiatives of the European Green Industrial Plan. We had an advantage here in Europe in this regard because we were the pioneer in the renewable sector, creating in Europe the wind industry. And now we need to protect the wind industry because the Chinese turbines are coming in lower prices that the wind turbines, that the European wind turbines are coming to Europe. The wind power sector is going through a critical moment today, and we must rely on it and promote to uh, the sector to achieve our targets. The low hanging fruit is the repowering of the older turbines in order to increase the capacity by one and a half to two times, increasing fast without uh, problems of social acceptance, uh, additional capacity. In fact, a successful energy transition should rely on multiple clean technologies. Let me say that the excessive reliance of solar power can create during specific hours oversupply, curtailments, or cannibalization of prices. So we need more wind. We need more wind, less solar, and we need, and we need more wind coming from uh, European uh, wind turbine uh, generators. 
to address the future, physical and economical future, we need to do some actions. And let me say, first, more technology planning. Not all the technologies are the same in terms of contribution to the sector. WIM is, is making a better contribution because it's, WIM is producing energy at night in winter and solar is producing very cheap electricity, but yes, at the solar hours. So more technology planning, more green grid investment, more storage, more pump uh, storage, more pump hydro, more batteries, more renewable solutions to provide more firmness in the system, like uh, biomass, and uh, all, the, all the things to promote the electrification to promote the demand flexibility, to adapt the flexibility of the demand to the new generation profiles. If we move in this direction, we will uh, found a favorable investment environment that is not just critical to the commercial technology, but even more essential for the emerging ones. More hydrogen, the hydrogen, green hydrogen, will present a promising opportunity for Europe to diversify the, 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 the approach of reducing the emissions and contributing to the global decarbonization, but we need to generate the demand. We are in the, in the field of green hydrogen, we are similar situation, but we, where we were in wind 20 years ago, the difference is that everybody was consuming electricity, but not everybody is consuming hydrogen, and we need to create the demand for the use and the consumption of the green uh, hydrogen. That's clear that we are in phase of a very complex context, but it's also true that the opportunities that we have in front of us are exciting. To accomplish the ambitious target, we cannot rely on promises of a better future. We need stable regulation less volatile regulation, European unique regulation, healthy investment. This is key, this is crucial. Climate change mitigation is not a cost, it's an investment. In fact, we have to pay now, and but we are paying now is a great premium for not being able of getting out of the burning fossil fuels. We need to continue with discipline, prioritizing the needs of the environmental and future generation, fostering the transition because the transition is a new economy. This is my view. Thank you. What you said we're addicted to uh, fossil fuels and because we're addicted to fossil fuels, we're staying in this crisis. Uh, that, that's I thought was a very good quote. So it's your addiction that ultimately keeps you in perma crisis. But I wonder, however, you, because you gave the contours of this, you said uh, solar, you didn't seem to be that keen to me. You said green hydrogen. Yes. Uh, you said more more wind. I wonder from now to 2040, what does the best cheaper, most efficient energy mix look like to you? That's a big question, the big money question. Well, that, that we need to, that, that we are looking for independence and decarbonization. For that, all kind of renewables energy and a smart combination of all of them, wind, hydro, pump storage, batteries, biomass, hydrogen, all combination of uh, the technologies in order to be independent, not depending on the, on the import of fossil fuels and all kind of technologies not emitting. That's clear that solar, in the solar case, we are importing panels from China and we are creating a very uh, low prices, but at summer, at peak solar hours. So we are creating the cannibalization of prices. Let me say that here in Spain, we are seeing sometimes especially during the weekends, that the price, the cost of the electricity or the price of electricity is nothing, is zero. But the, the transition is a new economy and we need to create jobs, to create new salaries. With no incomes, we can create salaries, we can create jobs. So the energy cost or the energy price for the consumers can't be zero. Nobody can imagine that the petrol station are offering the 
the product at zero price. So it's the same case in the electricity. The price is the result of a combination of technology offering to the consumers the product that they need, that is local and clean energy at the hour, at the time, at the day where they need. So this is the combination. In, in our case, we are using all the clean technologies because there is no winner. Each technology is making an apportation to the decarbonization and apportation to the independency. The combination is the optimal case. Well, thank you for that. And on top of that, there's a big uh, conversation as to whether or not China um, abuses its uh, position in, in a number of sectors. Some say even renewals may be studied. Um, now we're going to Megan Mitrovsky dale who is Director at Environmental Sustainability at Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners. I wonder, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, companies, the corporate, the consumer, how do you attend uh, to all of this, but you do this on a daily basis. So, so what do you see and how does the road look like uh, to 2040? Um, thank you. And Thanks very much for having me today. And um, I have to say, being around this table has been very inspiring for me um, and the work that I do. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I work for Coca-Cola, your Pacific partners. We are, if you don't know who we are, um, we're one of the world's largest Coca-Cola bottlers. We work in 29 markets globally, 13 in Western Europe. And what does a bottler do? A bottler is the company that makes, moves and sells uh, Coca-Cola products uh, around the world. Um, and so because we're one of the largest bottlers, um, we take our responsibility to sustainability really seriously. Uh, we take a value chain approach. We don't just look at what we do in our own four walls. We look across what we're doing with our suppliers and all the way to how we deliver to our customers. And we have a strong track record. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the past decade in particular. Uh, we're, we're really proud that we were one of the first 10 companies to have set a science-based target back in 2015. We're members of EV100 and RE100, uh, and we're members of the CLG. And we can see, even within our own operations, we can see uh, our climate-related risks, and we can see how they're impacting our own operations through droughts and floods in particular. Um, and we know that the long-term success of our business and the of our suppliers is going to be really um, dependent on how we respond to those risks. And that's why we've, we've updated our science-based targets. So we haven't stayed static. Um, we're focusing now on setting a net zero target um, out to 2040. And that is a target which is in line with climate science. So that means that it's aiming to reach a 90% reduction versus our 2019 baseline. And we also have a midterm target to reach our, to reduce our emissions by 30% versus 2030. We know that those are not going to be easy targets to reach. And so we're doing a lot of work in order to help reach those targets. So the first and most important thing is that we're working across all of our markets and all our functional areas and with our suppliers to set carbon reduction roadmaps from the bottom up. And we're working with our suppliers to get them to set their own science-based targets and switch to renewable electricity, because that's going to be absolutely key. Um, we're doing a lot of other work. We're working on investing in recycled content and in uh, collection and reuse. We're making all of our manufacturing sites more energy efficient and shifting to using renewable electricity. We're shifting to non-fossil fuels across all of our distribution network, shifting our own car fleet, so all of our sales vans and trucks, we're shifting all of those over to EVs, um, and we're making all of our cold drinks equipment. So all of the coolers or fountains that you use, we're trying to make sure that those are more energy, energy efficient. But we've done a lot of the work. I've spent the past six months doing mapping and building carbon roadmaps and looking and trying to figure out how we're going to get there. And we know that it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough to hit our 2030 target. It's not going to be enough to hit net zero by 2040. So we're going to need more help. We're going to need the support of legislators. Um, and if I can just give you a couple of examples about how and why we need that help. So you know all the cold drinks equipment that we have, like our coolers, our fountain machines. You may not know, but we've done a lot of work over the past decade to help reduce the emissions there. So we've put in LED lighting. We've put in EMS devices, which are the things that basically switch off the cooler when you're not using it. And more recently, we've taken out all of the old coolers and put in new ones, like replacing an old fridge from 10 years ago. Right? Boring stuff, but it's helped to reduce our emissions a lot. But that's not going to be enough. All of those coolers, our emissions are sourced from the electricity that those coolers are plugged into at the car fours of the world, right? And if those customers of ours are on green electricity contracts, great. But if they're not, 
they're using not green electricity grids. And that's going to be uh, difficult for us and for our customers to help reduce their emissions. It's also mo one of the most important things that our suppliers can do. One of the most important things that our suppliers can do to help reduce their emissions is shift to green electricity, which is why we've asked them to do it. But if they haven't done that, there and if all of this um, sort of demand is going to be coming, we're going to need to make sure that there's a huge shift towards green renewable electricity in order to, to pull that forward. I'll give you another example. All of our products are delivered, or the majority of our products anyway, are delivered by third-party transportation. So we, we contract out to, to other logistics providers to deliver our products out to stores. We've worked a lot, again, over the past decade to make sure that we're doing that in the most efficient way possible. We've got back hauling and front hauling agreements. What that means is that we make sure that the truck never drives empty. So there's always something in it. So there's no wasted miles. We're moving from road to rail. We're ship moving from road to boat. We are shifting to biofuels where possible. So we've got 100% HVO trucks in the Netherlands, for example. So we're doing all of this great work. Again, we know it's not going to be enough. We are going to need to do more. Um, and one of the things that we're going to need is to make sure that we've got the right infrastructure and the right types of vehicles available to us. When I've been building all of these carbon roadmaps with the country teams, one of the questions they keep asking me is, when can I get an electric truck? When can I get a green hydrogen truck? And I don't have an answer for them because quite frankly, the trucks that are available and the charging infrastructure that is available right now is not enough to deliver the distances and the payloads that we need to. And while green hydrogen may be a great hope for the future, it's not coming fast enough for us to be able to make that transition. So what I would say is, what do we need um, from the EU? Um, well, I would fully support the call for a 90% reduction versus 1990 levels in terms of reduction. It's fully in line with what we're trying to achieve and it will definitely help us to reach our targets. Um, I think we're going to need all of that um, in order to be able to ensure that we've got a fully circular economy for our packaging, um, to make sure that we've got a shift to fully green grids and that we've got a full shift to non-fossil fuels. So yeah, that's what I would ask for everybody to do. And I would just really ask that we One, two, one, two. Start from the beginning or? Okay. We'll start from the beginning after that technical hitch. Um, so this is the start of our second session, the Green Deal as a Compass for the EU's Future Competitiveness. My name is John Andrew and I'm a climate and energy reporter for Bloomberg News. So we've already touched upon the EU's 2040 goals, but how will the EU undertake its work in the next two decades in a way that doesn't harm its own competitiveness in a global world? We've already seen the US's Inflation Reduction Act, a package of billions of dollars to boost its own domestic green tech industry. Should the EU try and match that or does it have its own abilities like the single market so it can establish itself as a front runner over the next two decades? What technologies should the EU focus on? Should it be hydrogen, carbon capture, even nuclear? Or does it have others that we've not mentioned so far? In this session, we've paired up one policymaker with one business leader to see how the op objectives of opportunities and climate goals match up. So without further, to do, further ado, I'll introduce our speakers. We have Christy Klaas, Deputy Director General for the Green Transition at the Ministry of Climate in Estonia. We have Simon Hensel thomas Global Director of Climate and Nature at Inga Group, IKEA. We have Christoph Grudler, an MEP on the Committee of Industry, Research and Energy, Renew Group Europe. We have Dr. Kimo Yavanen, Head of European Governmental Affairs at Steelmaker SSAB. We have Ambassador Barbara Cullinan, Deputy Permanent Representative to, of Ireland to the EU. And we have Harry Vera, Head of Public and Government Affairs, Signify and Chair, Corporate Leaders Group Europe. So I'm going to take you two by two, a bit like uh, Noah's Ark, and start with Christy Klaas. I believe you've got some opening remarks about how Estonia views uh, the competitiveness question. Thank you. 
Yes, hello. Yeah, it's working. Good. Uh, hello. <clears throat> also from my side, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and just to just to start, I thought I would set the scene uh, a little bit to explain that the background Estonia is. Uh, Estonia is uh, having at the moment and going through at the moment. Um, so the pol uh, green transition has been high in the political agenda for the past years. And uh, especially uh, it started uh, uh, 2022 after the uh, ag Russian aggression in Ukraine. Of course, it was, I think, the um, the consequences that many countries actually had. First of all, uh, there was a shock, but after that, uh, many countries were working very hard to find solutions how to uh, substitute fossil fuels with uh, renewable energy. And uh, this year, um, Estonia uh, set a very ambitious goal in the parliament. It's stated in the law that by 2030, it means in seven years, uh, we will uh, more than triple our uh, renewable electricity production. So it means that 100% uh, our uh, of our consumption we will produce from uh, renewable sources. Um, it was, I think it was the, one of the major steps. And of course, together with that one, uh, a major legislative package was prepared in order to uh, speed up the development of, uh, of those um, uh, renewable energy parks. Um, during that year, also, the government uh, adopted a green transition action plan, uh, which was a clear framework. What do we need to do in all the policy fields in order to progress uh, uh, in, in terms of green transition? Um, and, and maybe the last one and the big decision also was uh, this year, actually, after the elections, uh, when uh, there was decided uh, a separate Ministry of Climate was formed uh, in terms of Estonia, it's huge. Uh, under, this, uh, under the responsibility of this ministry fall around 90% of all greenhouse gases emissions. So it means that um, within the margins of one ministry, all the all those uh, uh, answers can be can be answered. All those questions can be answered that uh, that we need to do in order to uh, reduce the emissions. So, and this year also we started the process of climate law, uh, which has been asked by by many many businesses and industry, uh, so that uh, we would have a clear regulatory framework in place uh, that that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't change. Uh, so we feel that the timing is ripe um, for all those uh, clear actions, uh, what we need to undertake in order to really achieve those uh, achievement, uh, those ambitious targets that have been set. So um, uh, what uh, do the, the companies and industry need? Um, let's say, first of all, I would like to point out uh, the need to cope with growing obligations. And maybe one of the things um, I would like to point out is uh, related with uh, reporting, with ESG reporting. Uh, and there, uh, of course, the, we have had a lot of articles also in the newspapers where really companies are asking how they could cope uh, with all those requirements that uh, are put on the table. Uh, and there we see a clear, uh, let's say, uh, nexus with digitalization uh, and with open data. Uh, for example, Estonia has uh, a fully digitalized energy network, which means that all the energy data is freely accessible, freely available, uh, which has uh, enabled um, uh, many startups and many companies to develop uh, different solutions, how to reduce the consumption of energy in the households, in the industry. Uh, and all, the, all those, these kind of solutions you know, actually are a great enabler also for, uh, for a greater and easier reporting. Um, then um, um, what, um, what I would point out, and I think the next speakers also will uh, point that out, is the, the, the need for clean energy, clean industry and enterprises pathways need to be in place. Um, for example, um, let's say um, 
uh, we have in Estonia the, the abil uh, ability to produce uh, CO, uh, CO2 free uh, asphalt. And um, this has been uh, the development just in recent years, um, which means that there has to be a clear um, uh, interaction and cooperation with, the, with academia. First of all, uh, we need to uh, remove all the financing obstacles that are there might be there in place. And plus, there needs to be a good cooperation between the government and the industry, because only then, uh, only then those pathways actually can be worked out cooperatively. And also, uh, we can understand what kind of obstacles do we need to remove in order to for example, enable to produce CO2 free steel or CO2 free asphalt, uh, etc. Then uh, avoiding greenwashing um, is also one of um, one of the aspects we are facing uh, every day. There are companies who are very ambitious already. They have uh, they have developed new products and services. And what do they feel is that um, Sometimes, in, in terms of competi competitiveness, it's difficult when uh, the, the other com companies are putting the labels on their products, uh, which are not really based on uh, through uh, and through data. So Europe is working on that, of course, and which is very good. And I think we should uh, we should continue uh, in this field. Um, and. Um, and finally, I think one of the great discussions that we will also have around climate law is that how we can spot the advantages that we have in, in this new economy. Every country is different. The size of every country is different. Uh, the industry, businesses are different. The, the geopolitical situation is different. But I would claim that every single country has their advantages. Uh, and whether it's production of clean energy, whether it's uh, hydrogen, whether it's uh, CO2 free asphalt or steel, uh, whether it's uh, CO2 free construction materials. So every country can find their specific an angle where, where they are strong and can benefit uh, from, from the transition. And I think this aspect is important because once the countries and businesses realize where the advantages actually are then they are ready to act uh, without this knowledge uh, it's very let's say challenging to to move on with uh, uh, with green transition in general thank you Thank you very much. And, and Simon, I'd love to get the retail perspective here. Obviously, the EU is also moving towards a more circular economy. How can companies like IKEA adapt to that and what opportuni opportunities are there? Yeah, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Christy. I thought you made some fantastic points. So I work for Inca Group. So when you go into an IKEA store, uh, nine out of 10 of them are run by Inca, so a franchise setup. Um, uh, I don't know when you last went to an IKEA store, but we have around a billion consumers going through the doors or on the internet now, um, online shopping as well. So that is an amazing opportunity for us as a company, but also a huge responsibility. Um, and I think Kurt was saying on the first panel, the ability to influence behavior and influence those consumers is, is really quite a window, which we would love to open. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Firstly though, I think it's important that a retailer does its own house and that we keep our own house in order. So. Why do we act on climate? And I, I was interested to hear from the lady from Coca-Cola um, bottling earlier on. I think we have a similar business case. So it's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, we do it because customers and coworkers increasingly are asking for it. And maybe most importantly is because we see that the future economy will only be going in one direction. So we wanna be on the right side of that climate transition by 2030, not on the wrong side. So yes, it's the right thing to do, but it is also going to be good for business to be taking action on climate and sustainability. Um, I think the just a few things. Um, we're committed to 1.5. We're committed to the Paris Agreement. Um, some of you may not know, we actually invest heavily in renewables. So we have invested 3.5 billion today in wind and solar, and we will up that to 6.5 billion by 2030. We've actually got more wind turbines than we have stores, so 594 wind turbines, and we also have 22 solar parks. It's actually around four terawatts 
uh, of energy, which is around 1 million EU households. So we're serious about investing in renewables, um, but we're also serious about influencing our customers. And I think the way we do that is by listening to them. Um, and I wanted just to highlight a little bit on where we see that our customers are feeling about sustainability. Um, so there was a Eurobarometer survey in July. I think it said around three quarters of consumers care deeply about sustainability and climate, but people are increasingly not sure what to do. And also the action on climate is slowing down and the action on sustainability. We did a similar survey with around 33,000 uh, customers with Globescan, and we found exactly the same, that over three quarters are very keen to take action, um, but people really are slowing down in terms of their agency. Fear is being replaced by apathy, unfortunately. Um, and some of the blockers are not knowing what to do. Some of it is also around cost. So we find that consumers, yes, they want to take, take action, but they don't want it to cost more. They don't, want to, they don't want to compromise on quality and they don't want to compromise on form or design. So this is, could be quite depressing, but it's also an amazing opportunity for us and other retailers that we really have that window to try and inspire consumers, to give them solutions, to give them products and services that they want so that they can take action at home. So it, it's both our own responsibility, but also leading consumers uh, also on that journey. Um, just wanted to say a couple of things on the policy dimension. Um, just came back from New York. I think a few of us were there at Climate Week. Um, I was actually really proud to be a European in, in, in New York. Um, I think the EU is doing some amazing things and uh, mainly the, the sort of clarity on the regulatory framework is is there and i think that allows businesses to take action and to scale up so that is a really clear signal um one example i think we talk about circularity um ikea is committed to being circular by 2030 and um one of the barriers that we see is making sure we make the connection between circularity and net zero so we will only become net zero by being circular and we need to invest in recycling in europe so we're investing in other technologies but we also want Europe to be a leader in recycling. And to do that, we need to start investing now. So I think one thing would be a clear ask not to underinvest in recycling uh, and not to be left behind by other parts of the world. One other example, and then I finish. Um, we Mattresses are a big problem. So I don't know how many of you have seen a, a mattress lying on the street, looking a little bit dirty, waiting to be thrown to landfill. So um, uh, IKEA and Inca, we've now invested in a big uh, mattress recycling company called Retour Mattress. Um, and it's doing really well. Um, it manages to recover around 85% of the materials. But one of the challenges we have is transporting material across borders within Europe. So in order to recover that material, we need to be able to, to recover that, we, uh, to um, transport it across, across borders. So one thing we would call on, we, um, we advocated for the addition of mattresses on the green list of waste in the waste shipment regulation. And it's just one example where I think we can stimulate the circular economy through regulation, linking it also with net zero. That's great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, and, and questions are open to the floor as well. We have a, a mic roving around, so do stick your hand up um, if you've got a question. But I did just want to ask both of you, actually, um, over the last couple of years uh, with the green transition, the green deal, I mean, we've seen a deluge of rules coming from the EU um, governing a lot of different facets of consumer life. Do you think it's time for the Commission to take a pause on the regulatory cycle or should it keep going with this momentum that it's already built up? I would encourage more speed, actually. Um, so I think uh, definitely do not slow down. Um, I think we've seen some great improvements. Take renewable energy, for example. I think some of the moves around making renewable energy permitting easier and faster has been fantastic. Um, we still do see some gaps, like I said, in circular economy. So I think uh, regulation is working. I think there is, for me, a con a, 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 not a red flag, but a concern around driving too much bureaucracy, particularly around reporting. Um, where I think we want to drive performance, we don't want to drive bureaucracy. And some of the ESG regulation, there is a risk, I think, that we drive bureaucracy, not action and performance. So it would be a lookout for me on, on ESG, just to make sure we're driving the right behavior. Yeah, I would hope that the next commission will keep uh, the green transition high in the politi political agenda. And, uh, and as we have started so so well and now when we really businesses and governments are thinking how to deliver on those goals 
uh, then we should have a, a clear a clear vision also what will happen now in the longer term so that we would keep the agenda uh, forward or we keep the agenda uh, alive. Um, what I do feel is that um, there's a lot of discussion about ambition uh, and setting goals and a bit less about uh, how to implement uh, all all those uh, all those goals so i think the focus has been there really to find those obstacles on those barriers and remove them uh, in a way that it would really help uh, our our companies and governments to uh, to achieve on those goals so so i think those two aspects need to be need to be in place uh, in parallel thanks and, and uh Maybe I can just add to that. Sure. I, th I think we also see um, there's a handful of companies taking action now, but I would say the vast majority still need to move. So I think, uh, especially when you look at SMEs and, and other other smaller retailers, we need to help them and give them regulatory certainty as well. So I, I think let's not be naive that everyone is acting and and you know we're in line with 1.5 because we clearly aren't. So I think uh, definitely don't take the foot off the gas. Excuse the pun. And, and Chrissy, I would just like to get. An Estonian perspective on the question. I mean, we've seen the US come up with a huge package in the form of IRA. Where, where from? Where do you see the balance between the EU having to compete with the US, while also national governments taking their own responsibilities? Um, I think you you put the question at the beginning also really well. So, what? Uh, how how should uh, EU relate with uh, with the uh, the other parts of the world? Um, I think the EU should be able to to produce their own green technology as well. We we cannot really rely on uh, on the ab abilities of, of of other countries, uh, not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of uh, resources, uh, in terms of uh, uh, other critical uh, raw materials. Uh, so we have to. I think the focus has been there, so so that we we would be able ourselves. To, to to produce to uh, to reuse to uh, to to use our um, our own resources in a more valuable way so um, of course the international cooperation uh, is is there and we shouldn't uh, and we will not forget uh, forget about that uh, however I think the focus has been our own own abilities does anyone on the floor have a question at this stage opening it up? In which case, uh, we'll move on to our next uh, duo of, of panelists and we'll, we'll come back to our first couple uh, at the end of the session. Um, Christoph Grudler, uh, you represent the Renew Group in, in Parliament. Um, you've worked on a number of files key to Europe's competitiveness, whether that's the Renewable Energy Directive or more recently the Net Zero Industry Act. How do you view this whole debate? Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to to, to, to say yes to your invitation, uh, which marks the 10th uh, year anniversary of the Green Growth Partnership. And well, it's a real pleasure for me. Uh, when I arrived at the European Parliament uh, in 2019, the only goal was the Green Deal. And uh, we, we have different issues, different problems. We have uh, the COVID-19 crisis. We have uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, of course, it, it was clear difficulties, but it was also opportunities to accelerate uh, on, on the, the Green Deal way. Uh, and that's what I try to, to, to do in all the, the text uh, I, I, I work in. Uh, you know, uh, we have 75 different texts uh, on, on the Green Deal huh, during this mandate, 75. Then I would like to say we, we, are, we need to accelerate, <laughs> but if we have 100 or 150 texts, it will be uh, very difficult. Uh, I, just to have an example, uh, I was a reporter on RED uh, 3. It was a revision of the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, two, uh, and we, when we began Red Three, we have a lot of months of work, uh, and during our work, arrive Red Four, and Red Five, and when it was finished, oh, uh, we have the EMD electricity market design, uh, which arrives, 
with CFDs and PPAs, it was supposed to be read six. But we say, oh, stop. Now let's finish our text. Uh, and, and uh, well, maybe one week before we finish the text on read three, the commission uh, take his delegated act about red two. It was uh, tw uh, 2018, uh, five years later. Then we have to accelerate, uh, but we have to be sure that all our texts are uh, taken into account in all the, the aspects. Uh, uh, because if you run without uh, the delegated act, without clear application for the industrial way for uh, all the stakeholders, it will be a mistake. But with uh, uh, 75 texts, I think we were able to, to do a, a clear, a good job. Uh, maybe I can. Uh, say some something about uh, about my new text about the, the net zero industrial uh, industry act NZIA as we say uh, when I am the rapporteur from from my my group political group uh, it, it's a new regulation um, intends to deeply transform Europe uh, by reducing uh, of course our carbon emissions uh, while remaining competitive. And this is very important because we can have a goal for carbon emissions, but without being able to, to be competitive, then it will fall. Uh, I do believe that sustainability uh, and competitiveness uh, need to be hand in hand. Uh, I do not oppose them. Uh, it is quite the contrary, I, I can say. Um, I, actually, I, I actually prefer talking about uh, competitive sustainability. I think it's maybe the best wording that we can, uh, we can use, uh, which is the ability of the European uh, industry to uh, engage investments in necessary innovations to uh, first uh, engage uh, its uh, transition uh, to sustainable development and then establish itself as a front runner in the global race of clean technology uh, development. We know that China, um, India, and the US are part of this race, and Europe needs to take uh, the lead in the clean tech revolution. Uh, Europe uh, has um, the, the full potential to, to take uh, this lead. And the NZI completely goes on this, in this direction. Uh, you can consider it as a response to the Inflation Reduction Act of the US, which for me was already an answer to the Green Deal. <laughs> Be careful, Europe was first on it, and it was very important. And to show the way to the world, for me, it's something, uh, it's something very uh, important. Uh, with NZIA, uh, we intend to facilitate the manufacture in Europe uh, of solar panels, wind turbines, water turbines, or part of nuclear reactors, for example, because uh, it's about clean technology. It's not only renewable technology. And I think both are going together, uh, as it was written in the uh, communi commission uh, uh, text in uh, 2018. Was for cleanest for a cleanest Europe, as I remember the name. It was written that uh, we need, of course, a lot of renewable on a small part of nuclear technology, 10 or maybe 15 percent, uh, in order to be sure to succeed on on the green deal way. The reason why we with those technologies, uh, we we want to promote in the IA all. Uh, all the possibilities to to have uh, clean uh, energy, renewable and decarbonized energy. Um, that we can say uh, it is key uh, a key text for climate action, uh, but also reindustrialization, energy sovereignty, and European tech autonomy. Uh, usually, I don't use the word sovereignty because it's it's not the best, I think. Uh, the best is maybe strategic autonomy. Uh, strategic autonomy, it, it means to have our destiny if our in, in our own hands, 
uh, when you have a COVID crisis uh, or a war in Ukraine, when the border are closed, we need to be able to have our energy, to have our own electricity. You know that we are depending at 64% uh, of imports in the, in, in the European Union. Then if we promote sustainable uh, renewable energy, for example, uh, it's also good for our autonomy. Uh, it's good for climate, but it's so good also for, for our uh, strategic autonomy. Then maybe uh, um, two things uh, that I want uh, to say at the end of this uh, short, to be carbon neutral by 2050, but also not to create new dependencies. It's the principle of uh, strategic autonomy. To do so, uh, two things needs to be done. First, to simplify the regulatory framework for industries. And second, to push for buying our European clean technologies. These goals are what we are trying to do with NZIA, uh, because producing clean technologies in Europe is a good idea. But if our public markets don't buy European technologies, we won't have won anything. With the NZIA, we have today the opportunity to massively support our European industry sector. Then, in order not to be too long, and maybe you will have a question, I think, um, I can say our industry needs massive investment to, to resist to siren coal. We, we can say of the American Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the main problem today is that uh, it's a good answer that we have, but without money. And I think it maybe it's a problem. Then we try to to have funds uh, with a step with different possibilities, sovereignty fund, etc. ETS revenue. Uh, well, we try to find solution to have a lot of money to to help uh, our industry. Uh, and instead. Uh, of reacting, the, the member states are too shy, uh, on, my, on my opinion, and are not willing to put money on, on the table. It can also help. Huh? It's not only Europe alone, but it's also with the member states. Uh, so I will conclude with uh, some words uh, for the business leaders present uh, today. Uh, come building uh, clean tech factories in Europe. We have the know-how, we have the skills, we have the technologies, and we have the market which is uh, going to boom thank you thank you very much christoph and we're very lucky as well to have dr kimo um from ssab um steel is obviously going to be one of the hardest sectors to abate uh, during the transition uh, how can europe stay ahead in that race yeah thank you thank you mr chairman and thank you for all of you joining us today it's it's a lovely afternoon quite sunny also and it's i love to be here to tell you the story about the uh, carbon free steel and as the as mr goodler was rightfully pointing out uh we need the steel also to be produced here in europe in order to support the energy energy equipment the production of energy equipment which are also going to be uh, carbon free or emission free. This is very important. I have here a couple of slides. And um, first of all, SSAP wants to be in the forefront of transforming the future steel industry. We think we are, and I will explain to you how we are going to do it. And we are actually following exactly what, what uh, MEP Kudler was here saying. We are trying to do it in Europe and specifically from in Nordics. Here you can see sun rising. I'm not saying that the sun rises from Sweden and Finland, but the future of the steel indeed rises from Sweden and Finland with our technologies. Uh, we have uh, already a long time ago, almost 10 years ago, uh, we made a decision, the board of, of SSAP, the owners made a decision that we will become uh, carbon free within the next. At that time, we were thinking 2045, because the Swedish carbon neutrality target is 2045. But then Finland said, we want to be carbon neutral 2035. And then came all of the political uh, proposals, political incentives. And we actually, within SSAP, our leaders decided that actually we will want to become carbon neutral 2030. 
and in doing so they have they will set the target to call for all other steel industry i want to point out this fact because there is at the moment no other no other steel producer who has the similar goals and who has done already what we have done in the sense of forming partnerships with our customers these customers who you see here the names the names of, of which they are already receiving our first lots or first trial lots of of carbon free steel and they are experimenting that steel they are using it in their production and this is i think very important message that we as ssap together with actually eu legislators the institutions want to send to everybody that it can be done it can be done and what we are doing is not only the steel and not only supplying the steel to our customers but we are also using the nordic iron ore so we are not importing iron ore anywhere else we are using the nordic energy and we will be producing the hydrogen in the nordics so whether you like it or not but we will be in this respect in carbon free steel we will be self sufficient in the, in europe and that is something that not very many can can claim it supports the resilience i also as a, as a Finn, I don't like so much of the sovereignty word. I agree with the MEP here, but nonetheless, the fact is that with this project that we are putting in place, investments which we are put, which we are putting in place, we will be self-sufficient or resilient, if you wish. And in the past, I have to tell you that we were importing iron ore from Russia, we were importing coal from Russia, and from many other places in the world. Now, in the future, it will not be needed, and that is the business case. That is the nice business case that we are establishing. As, as, um, as a company, we also think that, and we have noticed lately that this investment that we are putting in place has also several other social and environmental impacts, apart from the fact that we will have a competitive edge and apart from the fact that we, we will be able to lower our emissions. All over, all, all together, the emissions to air will be lowered, which means that the air is healthier to breathe and there are less uh, contamination by the human beings, which is a very good, important social aspect. Improved energy efficiency. We have found out that with this new technology, the energy efficiency is better than with the old existing technology. Reduced emissions to the water. That is also a plus because there are no really pollutants emitted to the water. Increased use of recycled raw materials, that's what we will be doing. Phase out of hazardous materials, value added to Nudix, this time Nudix clean energy, value added to hydrogen, new and modern skills. Our people, um, our employees will be, will have to actually, they will have to learn new skills. And when a person learns new skills, his value in the labor market goes up. It is a substantial uh, benefit for the people who are working for us, and we like that. Land use. We are building our uh, these new sites or new plants to existing sites. It's a brownfield. Uh, investment, which means that we are improving the existing site environmental performance significantly and yet at the same time we don't have to go to green fields we don't have to take land from from other uses because we have the sites there and end of dependency on in the, in the uh, imported coal and also other raw materials so ladies and gentlemen i hope this story first of and one thing i have to tell you and this is something i always tell in brussels 2016 when our ceo Marty Lindquist came to Brussels and he told the Brussels scene, including the, the, the colleagues, the competitors, that this is what we will do. Can you, can, can you guess what was the reaction? Can you guess what was the reaction in 2016 when we told that we will do this? Nobody believed, and I tell you, nobody believed. I was in a meeting where he told this and the colleagues were saying, this cannot be done, it's impossible because it's financially, not possible technically it's not possible and also uh, the, from, from raw material point of view because at that time we didn't know where the hydrogen will come from and what is happening today do you know what is happening today everybody all of the steel producers in europe have the same kind of pro proposals 
Even South Koreans have said by 2050. Even the Jap Japanese have said by 2060. But we are saying 2030. I hope you realize how big of a time difference there is between 2030 and 2050. So we are leading. I say we are leading and we hope to be leading in the future. And we hope to set encouraging example of all of, all of you who are doubting that whether this should be done or not. Thank you. You're, you're leading, uh, Kimo, but do you ever look at the US with envy and um, what's on offer? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, th well, there's always competition, and then we like the free world. There is always competition in this world, and 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 part of the competition is always also the framework, the legislative framework under which each of us, whether it's the U.S., whether it's the, whether it's the Japanese, South Koreans, have to work. That is for sure. It will never go away. Uh, some of you may not believe, but I'm an old man. And I've been around for 30 years, and I've never seen a business which doesn't have a competition. I mean, I was even doing business in Soviet Union in the, in the old days, and even it, within the Soviet Union, you have a competition. It's a different kind of competition, but there is a competition. I will not tell you what kind of competition that is, because it's probably not appropriate, but there is a competition. within. It. So my, my response is yes, I, we are very much very much surprised of I, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. We we are very much surprised of how Chinese are, are able to pour um, state money to their development. That's that's a matter that's a matter of fact and that's life. But when I was doing sales, the the number one rule is when I when you are in South Africa or wherever Zimbabwe is that you do as you do as you do in that country. You have to adapt. There is no other way. And I, I know, and I know that our institutions, they are actually doing quite good work. There are several instruments. We have uh, been lucky enough to enjoy innovation fund, funds report and, and, and just transition funds report. So it's not that this is a desperate place to do business. I mean, it's not a desperate place. We have some hopes, but maybe I come later on those months, but, but as always, there is room for improvement. Well, there we go. It's not a desperate place to do business in the EU. Um, does anyone have a question from, from the floor? Yes, I see one over there, gentleman in the middle. Uh, if you could introduce yourself as well, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, my name is Martin Porter. I'm executive chair of CRCL Europe, based in Brussels with colleagues here, and I advise CLG Europe. Um, I'm sort of provoked to say things given the excellent presentations we've had, not just the last two, but all four of them actually. Um, and I think one of the interesting questions that um, we've just heard from Chemo that uh, comes up is, at what point will it be proven that your first mover uh, risk has turned into a real advantage? Because as you said, it's very competitive, but it looks as if you've got ahead of the game from what you're saying. So that's a really interesting question looking forwards. And it obviously depends on uh, some of the support that you would have in Europe, exactly as you said, in terms of regulation and the framework that you're working within. But I'd like to come back to what Christoph said and maybe then uh, Christo as well, because you referenced competitive sustainability, which we've heard a couple of times uh, already uh, today. And I think it's an under um, leveraged part of the EU strategy for the Green Deal uh, to deliver competitiveness. The Commission has its strategy of competitive sustainability um, since 2019 as well. Um, and the, the basic idea behind that was that it would promote investment in innovation through regulations in the single market to create demand, drive innovation. And actually the SSAB example is probably a very good illustration of that. Um, but we still don't really um, measure that very well. So Christoph, one of the challenges to you, and this is something we've been looking at, we're still trying to use uh, measures of competitiveness, which are rooted essentially in uh, what we did in the 20th century, not we are, what we are now trying to do in the 21st century. Uh, and they need to be updated if we're really going to be forward looking, I think, uh, with respect to our future competitiveness. But linked to that, you also said, uh, obviously you're working on the Net Zero Industry Act, um, and that's part of the Green Deal industrial uh, plan. Um, which was a reaction to the US, uh, to some extent China, and has been welcomed, but is clearly not sufficient on its own uh, to the scale of the challenge, as you, as you also said. Uh, there are problems uh, maybe in terms of its breadth, how it's targeted, the money, the funding that goes with it. So I guess a question to both you and to Christo is, is do you now see a realistic prospect that the EU develops a genuine 
ambitious European industrial strategy that fully aligns with the European Green Deal and the strategy of competitive sustainability that is more than the sum of the parts. So not just each EU country having an industrial strategy, but a European industrial strategy capable of confronting China, the US and others. Should we start with Christoph on that one? Yep. Yeah, I will start. Um, you're right, and the IA is not the alpha and omega of all. Uh, uh, it's clear that it's one tool but we have a lot of, of different tools. Huh? We, we, we know that we fully believe with Commissioner Breton on the alliances, alliances for clean hydrogen, alliances for uh, for batteries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have a, a lot uh, of, of this, those alliances, which are an, an agreement to have state aids in the country we are able to huh? uh, to help uh, directly the, the industry. Uh, it's always a problem for me, the alliances, because I prefer to help all the countries uh, around Europe and maybe in the future uh, um, mandate, we can say, uh, I will try to promote the idea that the alliances will not only uh, say OK to set aid, but all, also put European money inside. Because if you put European money, the countries who are not able to have set aids can touch this uh, this, uh, this this money. Uh, just an, an example. Thank you very much for producing hydrogen in Europe. It's very important uh, because I fully support the production of hydrogen in Europe. Good for strategic autonomy. Good for for the climate also because we are not to transport hydrogen all around the world. I think it's very important. But you know we have another tool which is a bank of hydrogen, uh, which help the producer of hydrogen to have a, a, a cheapest price of production. Uh, you know that with IRA. Uh, the, the, the Americans say uh, we can give three euro for one kilo of hydrogen produce. With uh, the hydrogen bank, we will go to four euro to help for, for a kilo of hydrogen produced in Europe. Uh, then, of course, it's, it's global competitiveness, but it's not let the, the market alone. It's to push to promote we, we need to have a market on hydrogen uh, but first if we don't put public money inside uh, it will never start uh, that's the reason why we have a, all, a lot of different tools we are not alone in a part of the world uh, this will be in a partnership uh, we can have a very good relation with uh, the the partners we we want to to promote of course but first, uh, let's have our destiny in our hands. And after, of course, we can have a lot of memorandum of understanding, as we say, with a lot of countries, with a lot of companies all around the world. But first, let's know what we want to be in the future. We want to be an industrial uh, continent. Uh, we want to have use. We, have, we want to have skill. We want to have money, finance in Europe, uh, then we have to take it all into account in order to succeed for the future and for, and for, the, and for the, the next generation. And Christo, you, yeah. Actually, those aspects that Christoph pointed out um, are also seen uh, from the side of member state. I think without having this uh, collaboration and those alliances across Europe, uh, we will never achieve uh, this, uh, this competitiveness that we are, uh, we are looking for. Because not every country, uh, it's not meaningful to have their own, I don't know, um, industry, um, um, I don't know, how to um, uh, reuse or recycle mattresses or how to produ uh, produce uh, uh, carbon-free steel, etc. So there, there needs to be um, a clear understanding, a, a clear, let's say, the, the fr framework to how to form those alliances in order to be, to be able to cover all those aspects that need to be there in order to, to have this new economy in place. 
because the, there is a lot of huge number of green technologies that uh, need to be developed, uh, a lot of uh, new materials, uh, new resources, etc. So um, uh, just to keep the balance there, also that the the overconsumption or overproduction uh, in comparison with all the needs that we have, so there needs to be uh, really a good co co collaboration uh, among industries, countries, businesses, uh, etc. And um, Kimo, I'm actually interested in that first mover question because obviously we saw, we've seen in history in the EU with solar panels, for example, that the EU had the first mover advantage there and lost it. I mean, how do we prevent that from happening again? Yeah, that is a tough one because basically the rule of the world is that, that quite often the first movers are not the ones who are the, making the best, best money out of the inventions. Uh, the only recipe, I think the only recipe to avoid that is to run faster than the others, to be more effective and, and, and um, to be competitive. To, to acknowledge the fact that, that competitiveness is a key to the success also in terms of environmental performance. We feel, and now of course I have to, I'm subjective, my, my view is subjective, but we feel that we have all the ingredients that are needed to continue to be the first mover in this, this uh, sector. Um, there are some things that are difficult to buy, not impossible, but difficult to buy with money. And I think we have some of those ingredients. And one of the important ingredients ingredient is that we have the the already today almost, uh, I think it's 90-95% uh, uh, CO2 free energy. It's already there today, so we don't have to build it. In the future, we already have it. We already have the skills and the, the, the basic know-how how to do steel, steel that is there. We have to retrain the people, but anyhow, we have it. Because of we have the, the quite, um, quite uh, nice energy balance, we have the energy to produce to hydrogen in, in Nudix. We have water resources, we have land, we have even the iron ore which is important part ingredient. So I would say that if you look at the map of Europe or if you look at the map of any part of this world, I think there are very few places which has all those ingredients for steel production. Plus, and an important plus is that Swedish and Finnish uh, manufacturing industry, and you saw the names and, and there are Volvos, there are Kone Cranes, Kone and, and others to shipbuilding, it is also very strong in this world. So if these people who are using our steel, if they want to be, and if they want to use uh, carbon-free steel, it is manufactured next to their own backyard. So they don't have to go far away to find it. So we feel that we are quite, what is the right, correct word? We are not very clever if we are not able to capitalize on all these benefits that we have. But you are right, the competition is tough. And as always, there are, there are, there are competitors who are and who will have probably some other advantages. I think the biggest advantage and biggest threat that we see is, is, is uh, the race for the state aid subsidies. And this is an important thing point because suddenly if you are able to build a two or three billion euro steel plant without basically your own money it is an advantage it is definitely an advantage but even with those monies you also have to have all the ingredients in place great and we'll, we'll definitely come back to that at the the end of the session about the subsidy question but i'd like to move to our last couple now um ambassador barbara kalinen um you are responsible for negotiating many of these files as they come through the EU. Um, what's been your experience? And, and obviously, it's not just the big companies that matter here. It's also the small and medium-sized enterprises. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, John. And in fact, what I'd like to say really picks up on what has been what we've just been talking about here with Christoph and Christy and, and, and indeed Kimo as well, because we, we very much believe in Ireland that if we're going to have a more sustainable and more competitive Europe encompassing the opportunities of, of clean and renewable technologies, then we have to build on our strengths. 
and for for us the success of the European model has been based on firstly our openness and our extensive external trade links and I think that's really really important. The second thing has been the business friendly um, ecosystem that we have created in Europe and then thirdly our real our great strength is the single market and the level playing field. So we believe um, that by striking the right balance um, in competitiveness and sustainability can be strengthened without compromising these fundamental principles. Um, and that we these are fundamental principles that have a proven track record in terms of ensuring and securing European economic prosperity. And the decisions that we make today, um, uh, they will set the path towards a decarbonized industrial age, but we have to manage the risks associated with increased climate action. And we believe that these risks are particularly acute for SMEs. And I think this is a point Simon touched on, on on earlier. And SMEs are very much the backbone of the European economy. And certainly, that's certainly the case in Ireland. But the risks that we see include lack of access to finance, um, to implement actions to, re to reduce emissions and to increase energy efficiency. Another potential risk is, is the lack of skilled workers, because if we don't invest in green skills in the EU, we're not going to be able to deliver, to deliver on the opportunities in terms of uh, employment growth, jobs growth, and it won't be possible to meet our climate targets. And then a less obvious risk, but nonetheless still a risk, particularly for smaller and time poor companies and startups, is the increase in the volume and complexity of corporate reporting requirements arising from the green transition. And again, this is something I think that both Christy and, and Simon have, have touched on. So we need to ensure that these requirements are proportionate and that they're streamlined and that we're supporting companies to navigate this, this landscape. Um, in terms of the, the Green Deal industrial plan, it does, a it does cover all these areas and member states are going to have to prioritise them. In the case of Ireland, um, decarbonisation and net zero commitments are central elements of our white paper on enterprise to 2030, which was uh, published last December. The white paper aligns broadly with the ambitions of the Green Deal um, industrial plan and it puts decarbonisation and climate change at the heart of industrial policy. And our, our enterprise policy has been oriented to ensure that Irish firms, that first of all, that they're supported in meeting the cost of decarbonisation. And secondly, that they're positioned to exploit the opportunities of the low carbon economy. So we're supporting enterprises to become leaders um, in related innovations. We're focused on business model transformation, on resource circularity, and the development of the bioeconomy to promote sustainable practices and enterprise beyond carbon targets. Um, in terms of our policy approach, under our program for government, Ireland has committed to reducing emissions by 51% by 2030 uh, across the economy and to net zero by 2050. And this is enshrined in a 2021 piece of legislation. Um, in addition, Ireland has sectoral emission ceilings, and these prescribe five-year carbon budgets that are divided amongst different sectors of the economy. And over the next decade, we believe that this transition to the carbon neutral economy is going to substantially alter the business environment. But we're convinced that a strategic approach will enable Irish businesses to take advantage of the opportunities and to grow and to thrive. So, but government and industry are going to have to work closely together, a point Simon made, um, and I think that uh, it has been covered by, by Christoph also, that we're going to have to work closely. Government together, government is going to rely on the innovation and determination of from the private sector and the allocation of capital from financial markets. Um, many businesses are already aware of the changes in their customer preferences um, because of societal uh, um, uh, and commercial focus on sustainability. Um, banks and other lenders and investors are increasingly assessing the sustainability of their decisions uh, based on the, the transition to the, the car low carbon economy. And this significant this is a significant change for our for for society and, and the economy. But we're going to need new products and new kinds of services, um, and these these will all create value through their sustainability. So there clearly will be opportunities for business, and there's considerable scope for innovation in the design and development and delivery of these new um, carbon neutral products and services. And new business models are going to emerge. Um, I talked or mentioned earlier about SMEs, and from our perspective, achieving the transition to a sustainable economy will be impossible without SMEs, given their importance to our economy. Um, and so how we need to think about how we're going to, to, to support them. And we are seeing in Ireland that although, pro, although progress has been made in the green transition um, by our enterprise base, there is an evidence, there's clear evidence of a gap in progress between larger firms and SMEs. And SMEs are significantly less likely to have a climate plan and to 
measure their emissions compared to larger firms. And I think that's reflecting what, what you're seeing also, um, Simon. Um, Enterprise Ireland is the government organisation which works with Irish Enterprise to help them start, grow and innovate. And Enterprise Ireland has a green programme to help companies to incorporate sustainable practices. And um, the programme recognises that companies are at different stages of the, of the transition and their enterprise emissions reduction investment fund is targeted at companies of different size, sizes and at the different stages in decarbonisation. It includes putting in place energy mon monitoring systems. And this is really important to determine a, a, base a baseline and to establish the carbon footprint of enterprises. And they're providing grant aid towards capital investments in decarbonising so that companies can de de decarbonise their manufacturing process. It's also supporting research, development and innovation, for example, with innovation vouchers for SMEs um, in the areas of sustainability and decarbonisation. And very importantly, they're providing training and um, sustainability training and mentoring supports. So to upskill and to reskill SMEs and um, so to give them the knowledge that they're going to need to, to succeed in the green transition. And small businesses can also receive energy audit vouchers to get professional advice to increase energy efficiency and to reduce their costs. Um, I'd just like to finish, John, with, um, with a final point, which is on, on energy security, which has, has come up uh, in, the, in the discussions. And this has become a critical issue in terms of comp competitiveness for, for all of Europe in the last two years. Um, Ireland has an exceptional offshore wind resource. Our, our, our maritime area is approximately eight times the size of our land mass, and we're developing this resource, and it's going to put us on the path to net zero, but it will also create local jobs and help to future-proof our business. Um, we have an overall renewable uh, electricity target of 80% by 2030, and to deliver on it, we're going to install five gigawatt of offshore wind by 2030 and an additional two gigawatt of offshore wind that's going to be dedicated to the production of green hydrogen. Just to note that our 2050 target is actually 37 gigawatt of offshore wind. So we're developing a national industrial strategy to maximise this economic opportunity, both from a supply chain and an industrial demand perspective. And this is just one example of the significant supply chain and industrial opportunities that are out there now for Irish and for all of European business. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Barbara. And just last but not least, uh, Harry, um, you are the chair of, of CLG Europe here. Um, what do you make of what our previous panellists have to say and then how do you see the relationship between policy and business? Well, I think um, <clears throat> so what all panellists are, are saying in different words, it's all about speed. Uh, so also like uh, yeah, Simon mentioned on Climate Week in New York City last month, is not so much the direction that uh, that would be concerning. And we're not going to go back uh, to internal combustion engine and to incandescent light bulbs. Uh, so we are lighting company, has to signify, I keep adding as a new name for film lighting. Uh, but then it's about the speed. And there indeed, has, so the Green Deal industrial plan, it's a good thing. I think also there, we should not move into a blaming game towards the US or towards China. China actually, they had an industrial policy for 20 plus years, so it's to their credit. And it's, let's say, our mistake that we didn't have that. So we're building that now. But I think also reflecting on that, <clears throat> we see now that in the, let's say, in all the industrial planning, uh, there's a lot of attention to the supply side. Uh, let's say the supply side of the energy mix, energy intensive companies, and that's all good. And scaling up renewables, super important. But then some things, so hydrogen and nuclear, will take a lot of time for scale and impact. And we see a bit the weather anomalies, particularly this year. But also the fact that if you look at the last 10 years, as Europe, have, we are more or less importing for 1 billion euro of fossil fuel per day, uh, that we need results. We need results in reducing energy costs, uh, let's say the energy bill. Uh, we need results in emission reduction. And we should also realize there, uh, so Europe will never, never, ever have the cheapest energy. So we should be leading in least energy. And there's a lot of untapped potential let's say at the demand side huh? so what i would say there uh, let's balance uh, the approach on the supply and on the demand side uh, for a couple of reasons uh, first of all a lot of let's say quick uh, mitigation is possible uh, i'll give you a few numbers on lighting uh, but also there are a lot of strong companies in europe on that demand side if you look at us uh, we are the world leader in lighting but also siemens abb uh, schneider electric uh, but also uh, Velux, Danfoss, you name them. So those are all really strong companies. And 
if we then accelerate market uptake of those efficient solutions uh, by also implementing, and it's a lot about action, uh, implementing the energy efficiency directive, agreeing on an adequate uh, building directive and also implementing that, uh, then actually we create yeah, a lot of jobs that people are uh, changing the lights, uh, but also putting in building management systems, double glazing and so forth, uh, that replace uh, that billion euro of fossil fuel import per day. There's also, the when you look at the demand side, it is also important to, to let's say, to realize uh, that energy efficiency, according to IPCC uh, and to the IEA, has to do 40 to 50 percent of keeping us within safe warming boundaries. And as I mentioned, this uh, it's all about speed. Uh, so we were already, I think, more than 10 years, one of the technologies on the list in China, same as solar panels and others, uh, of industries that they want to dominate. It's all fine. Uh, it's competition. So we foresaw that, and we also knew, and that is also why in, in 2006, in December, actually here in Brussels, we called for something that was very symbolic, and it's sheer logic now, uh, for the global phase out of incandescent light bulbs. And now it sounds like, okay, that was like a, a no-brainer, uh, but it was world headline news when we did it. It was also still two-thirds of our sales volume, and at the time, lighting was 19% of global electricity. And what you see we did is also, let's say, as an industry, so we agreed with Osram, which was then part of Siemens, and with G Lighting, obviously a part of G, that we would compete for the same, same vision of the future. But they were a little bit slower, so they're gone. And so you see, it is also not only a race for human survival, but also a race, let's say, for our own <laughs> company survival. And I think if in that sense you see what, let's say, large demand side industries matter to Europe's future competitive sustainability, this is also an area where we need to, let's say, accelerate. Uh, and that can be done by accelerating it towards the magic 3% per year renovation rates of infrastructure uh, by looking, let's say, how can procurement help and accelerate, take a lifetime perspective, and a lot of things uh, that the other panelists have spoken about. And i give you one example there. Uh, what is then also relevant, uh, we see there's a lot of attention on the energy transition, uh, but we need to also to approach that in a more integrated way. Uh, and I'll give an example <coughs> example on, on lighting. So we are, we are very, uh, let's say, uh, fortunate that we are seen as a positive sector because of the things that, that I just mentioned. Uh, today, we are 85% LED. We are we actually, we were world leader in all technology and tubes and bulbs, and we are world leader in digital and connected smart LED lighting, which is pretty unique. Uh, but then also being 85% LED, 50% of all the light points in Europe uh, are still all technology. So if those would be replaced, which can be done much quicker than some other things, and then not only Europe would save 65 billion euro per year, uh, reduce 51 million tons of carbon, but also what we call it would free up a massive amount of electricity that can be used for the electrification of heating and transport. And that, those are big numbers. And of course, also we need to do the other things on efficiency, adding that up. Well, I know the, the numbers from our sector, because actually, interestingly, I like number crunching and modeling, but the average electricity consumption of a household is 3,400 kilowatt hours. The global average is exactly the same as the European average, by coincidence. An electric car that drives 10,000 miles per year, which is more or less the, the, the number that's being used, needs 3,400 kilowatt hours. A heat pump, depending on the size of your house, needs more or less the same. Uh, I live in the south of the Netherlands, uh, close to Eindhoven, which is also called Brainport, uh, the Silicon Valley of Europe. GDP growth in the region, hi Maria, is 6%, so more than China. But the grid is congested. There are hundreds of companies that are waiting for more electricity, and it's not there. And so that is why I'm telling with this example, and there are more, that we need an integrated approach to the energy transition, and then we can make renewables count more instead of throwing part of those away. We can efficiency help electrification and we can increase the speed that is actually going to determine very much our competitive sustainability, but also how that will, from a positive perspective, accelerate the pace in every region in the world. So really seeing like, hey, this is a race, sustainability, acting on climate change is innovation, so that we innovate towards the future that we, that we desperately need. Thank you very much. So you've heard from our six speakers there. Um, any questions from the floor on any of those topics? 
No, in which case I'll, I'll ask my own. Um, obviously, recently we've heard a lot about the EU looking into probes, namely against China on all sorts of technologies from electric vehicles to steel. Um, do you think this is the right approach when the whole world needs to be heading towards net zero and, and China provides many of these technologies at a much lower price? Um, I'll hand that one off to Barbara, would you be willing to take that to start with? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I think rather than focusing on one particular one, one particular aspect of, of, I mean, what's clear from the debate here is that there's a whole lot of strands to 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 our progression to to net zero. So rather than focusing on one particular aspect, which might be the competitive aspect or 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 or, or in, inquiries or whatever, I think I think the key thing is, and this has very much come out, I think from 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 Chemo um, uh, and, and 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 indeed from Harry as well, that the advantages for Europe in being an early mover in all of these technologies and in, in, in taking these opportunities and building up because we as i said we we believe in the global markets and our ability to compete in the global markets and to export and we need to be able to compete with with companies up all over the world so we need to be the leaders in in these areas and we do have the skill sets we do have the result we do have highly educated workforces certainly i know speaking from my own country where we have one of the highest levels of secondary education amongst amongst our workforce but we're a small company we're a small country when you look at europe as a whole and the population that we have we have huge strengths and huge huge assets to build on and if we can upskill um, our workforces for for these opportunities i think we can compete with anybody and we, we will we will have to we will have to look at where our weaknesses are and the risks and manage those risks but as i said we also need to build on our strengths and i think that 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 that, that that's where we should start from is looking at the strengths and building on those and and simon I was thinking, I was reflecting what a privilege it is to be sitting on a panel where we're all talking about the race to the top. Um, and maybe 20 years ago, would we have, you'd almost pinch yourself to feel that, that feeling where we're almost nervous that we're not going to win the race. But then I would also say it's a race that we all kind of need to win. Um, and I think for most companies like IKEA and, and probably Signify and SSAB, if you're operating in multiple markets, we need to move in all those markets, right? Um, so at the moment, for us, renewable electricity is quite quite easy to do in all of our markets apart from India and, and South Korea and we want to close that gap so um, maybe it's to say um, let's keep the competitive spirit but let's also remember that that we all do need to win the race um, I think that's quite important and Harry you have something to add <clears throat> yes yeah, so just a few remarks and then I think also like like Barbara saying we have the talent as a Dutch person I would say we also have Max Verstappen he has a talent uh, but <laughs> But then we need to bring it to life and implement that. But I think also how we talk a lot, if you look through a lot of discussions, had we look a lot at technology, at policies and financing, but we also need to give this a people face. If we really then, let's say, talk more about an, an understandable vocabulary, what are the real people benefits? Huh? So we see examples with better street lighting, less traffic accidents, uh, less assaults, and really double digit improvements in cities around the world. Uh, let's say more comfort at home, more productivity in the office without having to work harder. So I think if we give it this people's face and we demystify and actually people that are confused and don't exactly know what to do, they see like, ah, okay, and they get this sort of, aha. And then, and then this will also translate into their voting and buying behavior. Because I think the psychology there of them be embracing change is also really important uh, as part of the, yeah, let's say to create, to increase the speed. And I think we have the education level, so a lot of people will understand if you communicate in that way. So let's not forget uh, next to policies and technology and finance, we need really to give this a, a human face and communicate in a way that the larger part of the population who are not, let's say, let's say high on technology or expert on policy, so that they understand and turn it into voting and buying behavior. Great. Feel free to uh, put your hand up if you have a question. Oh, we have a question. Yeah, Kimo. I don't have a question, I have a comment and and when I was a young man I used to travel, I used to live and travel around the world, I, six years in Japan and, and US and so forth, doing business in, in Africa and, and South America and it's not in every continent and in, not in every country that ordinary business people can go to their representatives and say look this is not 
correct. This piece of legislation has to be changed and they listen to us. And here we have actually a prime example because I was giving or we were giving with my colleague some amendment proposals to, to, to the representative and he took some of them. Also it works. So. It works. <laughs> it works. And if you think of this, it is actually a value. It is a value that we have in Europe. And I can tell you many countries, I don't have to name them, where it goes totally other way around. It comes from the top. And then they tell you, you established a steel plant here. You do cement plant here. I give you this and that if you do it. But it's it, then the voice of the people, the entrepreneurs, is not heard at all, basically. And let's let's um, embark on this value also in Europe. Let's use this valuable asset, which we probably always don't realize that we have it in Europe. So we have a possibility to talk to the people who are setting and, and building up our business framework. And, and together doing it, I think we will succeed on this one. It's not easy. And let me, let me say it, allow me to say it, we are sometimes very slow here in Brussels, but you know it, eh? it takes sometimes years compared to the some more autocratic, autocratic places where it's like this, but let's, let's um let's um use this valuable asset that we have and i think we will we will be able to make it. i think one of the areas where europe isn't so competitive at the moment and harry you you mentioned it is the price that citizens and businesses pay for their energy um and obviously that was something that came very much to the fore after russia invaded ukraine um last year um Chrissy, I was wondering from you, I mean, what more do we need to see at EU level to help bring down the cost of power for, for citizens? And obviously at the moment, we're seeing quite a lot of disagreements between France and Germany over what kind of power should be used um, during the transition. I mean, if what what is your message to, to those two big countries at the heart of Europe? Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, what we have realized uh, very clearly after the uh, invasion is that you cannot have all the eggs in one basket in the in the uh, energy sector so you have to ha you have to have the mix uh, and you have to have the mix uh, from different uh, uh, point of view well, one of them is the price uh, the other one is the energy security and defense policy, actually. Uh, so when you don't produce all your electricity from one place, which is the case in, in many, many smaller countries where one, one region is, uh, let's say, is the basis of uh, energy production, uh, then you are more vulnerable. Uh, if um, if you haven't uh, if you haven't let's say uh, mixed uh, mixed your energy production, so I think a lot of things. What what I what I see now from Estonian point of view, a lot of things have uh, been done already uh, from the side of uh, European Union, in terms of uh, speeding speeding up. Uh, the development of uh, renewable energy parks uh, and it has uh, it has helped uh, quite a lot uh, so as i said uh, the extent extensive uh, extensive um, legislative package that uh, we have been working on was actually based on those uh, proposals that uh, came from the eu um, the um, the cooperation between the countries is one of the aspects i think uh, which uh, should be further elaborated um, especially the um, let's say the, the in terms of ener energy grids uh, so that the energy would be transmissible between the countries uh, etc this 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 is something also we feel that um, you know, more, more work should be should be Put, uh, put on. Of course, we have uh, one a very good case in uh, uh, we have um, been cooperating with Latvia in order to establish a common uh, uh, one big offshore wind park. Uh, but these examples, I think, should be more common across uh, across Europe. Christoph, and you're you're at the heart of these negotiations. What's what's your take? Yeah, I'm working on EMD, electricity market design, and it's very complex. I, I fully agree with what Christy said, and I just, we have a, a poor example today because you know that the interconnection between Estonia and Finland 
uh, has, has a blast uh, today. We don't know if it is a Russian or if it's an accident. Seems to be the Russian, but we are not sure at this time. Uh, it means that uh, there is two problems with electricity. The first is the price, of course, but it's not the only problem. Uh, the uh, the availability uh, is is also important, may, or maybe more, because the citizens will be very angry when the price of energy is expensive, but they will be more angry if they have no lights, if they have no heating uh, during the summer. Uh, and that's the reason why we have to, to look very carefully on, on the two sides. Uh, and of course, with electricity market design, we, it, it works huh? for, for a lot of years, this, this electricity market, uh, but it was not done uh, to have a so high price uh, on, on the gas model, we, we can say. Uh, and now we, we have to find a new, a, new, a new tool in order not to say during six months uh, uh, at this level of price. You know that with the merit order, uh, first you, you renewables, so second hydraulic, third nuclear power, it's all electricity. And after, if we have not enough production of electricity, we need to start gas, petrol, coal uh, plants in order to have enough electricity for all. Uh, some propose to, to cut electricity on the side, gas on another side. Uh, I, I first, on, on in France also, and I was the first to say in France, no, uh, it's a real mistake because uh, if you finish all the electricity uh, tools, and you need more electricity, what are you doing? You say to the people, okay, you stay in the black, uh, no lights. No, it's not possible. After electricity, you have to uh, to, um, to start uh, gas or, or fossil uh, e energy. Uh, well, the best solution, of course, will be to have enough renewables, enough hydraulics, enough decarbonized energy, uh, in order never to start uh, those fossil uh, system. Then now uh, we find a solution in electricity market design. And I hope that the member state will find a good solution together. I hope that today in Hamburg, uh, Germany and France will agree on it. Uh, uh, we have a long-term contract with our solution. Uh, uh, for, um, you can say, PPAs or CFDs. Uh, of course, it's long term, but uh, it's a way uh, not to increase so much the price on, on the spot market. Uh, and I think it is a way. Of course, sometimes it takes uh, a long time. Huh? Uh, for example, for gas, when we explain to the people today that uh, and Ursula von der Leyen did it, that the price of the gas is 10 times less than uh, one year before or some months before uh, and the people receive is not and is not able to see anything it's normal because we store gas uh, at the highest price and before the time it arrives to to the final user uh, it takes a lot, lot of time and it's very complex to explain to the citizens it but i'm sure that with a lot of pedagogy with a lot of, of explanation and with a lot of uh, agreement between with the moment state between the the people who are inside the Electricity, electricity market, we will find a, a, a good solution. Great, we're, we're nearing the end of our, our session now, but I do see we have one question from, from the room. If you could introduce yourself as well, that would be great. Thank you. I'm Simon Connell from Beringa Partners and a senior associate at CISL, uh, or CISL, as you prefer. Um, we've heard a lot about consumers and carbon and the energy markets. Given the breadth of the Green Deal, I'm really interested in the panelists' views on what excites them, what the optimism and the innovation might be as we start to think about circular economy and biodiversity. And particularly, thank you, Simon, for your comment earlier on mattresses. Um, but I'd like to hear more from others about moving beyond carbon and how we bring consumers with us in that process. Is there anyone who'd like to say that, Simon, first? <coughs> Great question. I love that. What are we excited about? Um, I think we haven't really talked about biodiversity today, but I'd love to pick you up on that. I think um, I think we need billions of capital to flow into natural capital and um, to flow into ecosystem restoration and 
we have an amazing foundation with the EU restoration law. I think it's super exciting the kind of financial methodologies that we will get to scale nature, because at the moment we're relying on philanthropy, which is good and we have some good examples, but imagine if we could unlock the potential of private capital in a really systematic way to really restore nature in Europe and beyond. I think that is really exciting. And I know there's some banks working on it and we had some sessions in New York. Um, so there are some good things happening. I still see it's still a bit too philanthropic. So imagine if we had a solid business case, I think it'd be amazing what could happen, yeah. Great, and we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna ask the panel one question. Um, between now and 2030, what's the single thing that the EU can do to boost its competitiveness globally? And if you could keep your answer very short, that, that would be great. So if we start at the end, uh, Christy, I don't know if uh, you want to kick us off. So I will be very, very brief to make it, <laughs> make it quick. Um, to push for, uh, I think, the circular economy, uh, to push more for the solutions, more for the enablers, uh, so that uh, we would be able to produce more our own resources, find new materials. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think the, I, I, I will give the chance to the others too. <laughs> Great, thank you. So a regulatory uh, harmony and also um, stimulate investment in a circular economy. That's two for circular economy. Um, Christoph? <laughs> For me, the first thing is that Europe has to be stop to be naive uh, and uh, uh, find a, a real fair competition in the global market, a real level playing field, uh, and uh, to trust in his own capacity to succeed the, in the global market. Kimo? Yeah, I'm happy to continue along the same lines. We need a reform of the trade policy in Europe and also globally. Because what is not happening in Europe is that our trade policy is not aligned with our climate policies. And I could go long in this explanation, but I will simply say that we don't have any trade tools to take into consideration environmentally harmful imports. We don't have a tool, no tool whatsoever. And that is partly destroying, not destroying, but that partly harming the European uh, green transition. Barbara? I think there are aspects of the transition where it's going to be difficult for us to compete with other parts of the world, but the one area where I think nobody has an advantage, but potentially we do, and we can certainly leverage it, is in skills. If everybody needs, all parts of the world are going to need skilled, really highly skilled and upskilled people to deliver the green transition. Nobody else has an advantage on us over that. In fact, we we could have an advantage. We have a very good base to build off. And if we really leverage that, I think that that can give us a competitive edge. Great. And finally, Harry? Yeah, now building on that, and with the example I gave on Max Verstappen has a lot of talent. So in Europe, we have a lot of talent, but we also saw it's a lot of hard work. Uh, so with lots of the policies now in place, <clears throat> I think it's also a good moment to switch our thinking and to spend less time on agreeing what to do and more time on doing what was agreed. So to roll up our sleeves, and let's say get traction and through action. Great, well, thanks to all of our panelists. That concludes the session and uh, we'll start again in a couple of minutes on expectations for COP, a subject close to my heart. So let's go.
Everyone, sorry, we're about to start the next session. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much. And we're back for what is the final session uh, of the day. And we're joined by Bas Eghud, who is uh, MEP. Uh, he sits on the Committee for the Environment, Public Health, and Food Safety. He's also vice chair of the group of uh, Greens and the European Free Alliance. He's sitting next to me, so he is obviously joining us in person. Uh, joined by him, given the hybrid nature of some uh, events. Um, well, there you go. Then we're also joined by Maria Mendiluce, who is uh, CEO of Women uh, Business uh, Coalition, and also joining us is Oris Veit, who is a State Secretary for Environment and Climate for Slovenia, so he's representing the government of Slovenia. Thank you uh, very much. Obviously, the title of the session is uh, The Road to COP and uh, the expectations around uh, this meeting. I wonder whether you're excited about this COP meeting, whether you feel uh, there's room for improvement, whether you feel uh, in one particular way about the host uh, country. Uh, some have say, well, suggest that there's a contradiction in just the location by itself. Others say that's a reality of where we are right now in the world of uh, the energy crisis. So I wonder putting all of this together, how excited on a scale from one to 10 are you? Starting with me? Yeah. Um, five. So not super excited. I think still we can get something out of it, but let's be honest. No, I uh, looking at the importance of this COP and what it should be, and then the expectations, but also the, the debate towards it, I think we need to uh, gain a lot of more traction. So for now, I'm not, uh, not, not there yet. So I'm on a five, but, but I hope I can uh, gain still. And crescendo, okay. <laughs> In some way, this COP when the, the government keeps the vote because um, 28 cops. Yes. Okay. That's good. Okay. So this is the cop when the rubber hits the road. Uh, 28 cops. We have not included in any of the text the fact that we need to phase out fossil fuels if we want to tackle climate change. So it is about time. I have to say that uh, um, Sultan Al Jaber, in every speech, he's saying that the phase down of fossil fuel is inevitable. So, in that respect, uh, and with the many caveats that he includes in those sentences, I am uh, um, not optimistic, hopeful. But uh, we always we don't lose hope, right? That finally at COP28 we will manage to to say what is obvious. Thank you. Yeah, as well, from my side, um, ab about a seven. I, I have to say that uh, I, I don't find excitement to be really the, the correct word. I, I'm more uh, hopeful or uh, anxious or, or, or concerned probably than I am than I am uh, uh, anything else. But uh, I, I, I would still like to say that I, I, I believe that this year's COP is a milestone uh, uh, in a way that I believe that every single COP will be a milestone until we are on track to reach the one and a half degree target. So unless we are on track, uh, it is very, which we are not, it is very important for this COP to, to deliver upon 
elements which will make sure that we that we're heading in the right direction if it doesn't it's another year lost and uh, for the process, um, we cannot stand man, many more of 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 such of of uh, cops not delivering upon what is needed. But but does the format I wonder still work for you? Is is it something that you say? Yeah, it does because it brings uh, governments, it brings uh, research, it brings business. Although I should note, last year there were a lot less uh, members of the business community compared to Glasgow. Some said it was because of well the energy crisis at that point, because public may was or could be losing some interest in it. But given the whole uh, situation, uh, do you also believe that business has to be represented on a on a bigger way? Because a lot of people read it as maybe they're not as committed as they said they were a year prior. We are, I heard that we're expecting more than 70,000 people. So from a climate perspective, this is horrendous. Let's face it. Okay. So we're not walking the talk. I find that probably we should move to a model where the regional climate weeks are more important so that we mobilize the business from the region. That said, the, le the train has left the station for this one, but I think Simon Steele you know, has something to do there because it is more than 70,000 people. I think it's good that business are showing in these conferences and they come because they're looking for business. And when climate is a business, it's good because that means that it's an opportunity. So, so I think that should give us hope that we just need to find the mechanism for this to happen throughout the year so that we don't all go at the same time. And also so that uh, these conversations are happening at national and at European level where actually decisions are taken that are going to impact the businesses. And so this, the Green Growth, this, this platform is one of these places. Uh, do you feel like, uh, because she made a very good point, you have COP, there's a height in interest, it's everywhere on TV, everyone talks about it, then something gets agreed, although last year everyone remembers uh, how that ended, maybe not on the high note that everyone was expected, a, a very fast one uh, that was pulled by India, but uh, beyond that, as, as Maria was saying, should there be a more of a kind of follow-up check on the implementation is there too much of an up and down from every edition where we go on a high and then we kind of forget until the next year no i do think to be very honest i mean uh, we have to look at really what we're doing at such a cop um because i think there is always and more and more now the opening is with high level statements right and then you have the feeling you get uh, two weeks later something out that has not so much to do with the high level comments at the beginning. So you're also having a credibility issue here. I mean, there's no head of state anymore that is saying climate is not important. So they're all repeating that message. But then in the end, basically, uh, after they left, then you get, and now I'm going to say something nasty. So those who is legally trained, don't close your ears. Uh, but But... It's taken over by the negotiators who have been doing this business for 20 years. So give them a bone and they, they fight over every legal little uh, comma and, and point on it. Whereas I think more and more what we need is a political summit where the heads of state should also stay longer. Then this can be much shorter. But then you need to have also conclusions coming out of those statements that are much more related to each other. Now, what happens too often is that the leaders come away with, to be very honest, nice speeches, but how many people still believe those speeches? And those conclusions should be much more related to it. And then, of course, there is always much more legal work to be done after, but you don't have to do that in the conclusions. I think we are much more stuck now in, in, you know, in the Paris Agreement, Article 6, and people can discuss Article 6 really for decades, no problem. But that's not where, the heads of, where you need the heads of state for. You need the conclusions on what is the future of fossils, what is the future of renewables, what is the future of efficiency. There you need the conclusions on, and then you can have separate meetings where you can all have some legal advisors on the text. But I think we should more and more uh, split the two. Then you can also have a shorter summit, which I think also uh, would be in the benefit of quite some people. Some say it's also getting very long. The leaders are there for one, two days max, then a whole week goes by, then people forget, and then we'll go back for the grand finale if it's a grand finale. But speaking of a finale uh, this year, what would it make or what would you like to see to say Yes, I was going in five out of 10, but actually it was a successful cop. 
I think if we now finally going to call a spade a spade, uh, and that is indeed, and this is also something where Europe needs to improve, because I know uh, uh, we all like to congratulate ourselves that we're doing very ambitious things. So it's it's very good. Huh? I mean, however, in the world that that message also is getting a bit tire, tiring, that people feel, oh, there they come again. Yes, you're br okay, you're brilliant. You have your fit for 55. Fine, good enough. But now also, when you talk to the Europeans and when there was a gas crisis, suddenly we were we were all over the world buying gas as fast as possible and we didn't care about the price. We could afford it and others were staying left alone. So the credibility of Europe is also at stake here. And I think here we need to be very clear that, that if we want to succeed and want to stay below the 1.5 degrees, it's not only talking about the good things that need to accelerate, which we all agree with, but we also need to talk about the things we don't want anymore. And then it's not only talking about coal, because that also is felt by a lot of developing countries like, yeah, that's a bit easy for Europe to talk about, but we need to talk about gas. We need to talk about oil. We need to be open to those issues that are also painful to us. Then we show we are really, really credible. And I think that that's really a narrative that we also should improve on as Europeans. And so I would be going beyond my five, if we really are going to talk about the end of fossils, the end of fossil fuel subsidies, not inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. I've, I've never, no one still can't explain to me what efficient fossil fuel subsidies are. They are by definition inefficient because you are paying for pollution that's never efficient. So why all this language? And we should not agree with that as Europeans, but then we should also look at ourselves because we are also still doing fossil fuel subsidies. Let's be honest about it. So I think some kind of more willingness to do self-reflection as Europeans would benefit the negotiations as well. And that's what a number of countries, by the way, have said to that Europe is going to cope with a lot of baggage because of the situation that's played out for the past year. You want to add on? I, I wanted to come in on one point um, and to give uh, a bit of insight uh, on, on that. I, I believe that, that um, the EU is actually doing a much better job now than it has been in in, in looking back at uh, at previous cops i mean especially looking back uh, at 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 copenhagen in in 2009 i i that was my entry into eu level uh, climate uh, policy exactly i i i was a deputy permanent representative here in brussels and we were preparing the the eu position for copenhagen and it was full of the same words that we still have now that uh, eu is a leader a global leader it must remain a, a global leader etc but at the at that time, uh, when we checked the newspapers after the Copenhagen, we were completely, uh, it was a complete surprise to us uh, here in Brussels, looking at Copenhagen, that we were completely out of the picture in the last uh, last few hours of, of, of the COP. Um, what, what was salvaged uh, at the COP was basically done, should I say to my remembrance, to a lot through outreach, especially from the US, uh, the Obama administration at the time. and. EU was not much to be seen then. I think since then we've we've gone we've gone f further in in establishing. Uh, um, I think also much clearer EU positions uh, to 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 third countries. Uh, I mean, one one bridge we had to cross was uh, getting an understanding of what it is actually that the EU is doing. I I remember in the 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 first round of uh, of the biannual. Um, reporting after the the, the Paris uh, agreement where we were explaining still uh, why uh, this division between ETS and non-ETS and what uh, what countries uh, targets actually are and what is common what is not I mean it, it was uh, at, at the beginning it was hard for others to really understand what how ambitious we actually are because they couldn't understand the whole the whole system that we that we built together so I mean we've gone some some far some far Far way uh, ahead in that, but we still have uh, some homework that we have to do for, I, I think, for um, um, for previous uh, announcements or, or previous expectations. So I think for this COP, uh, and to build on what what you asked before on the results, w one thing that we must do also already before the COP is really to make sure that uh, uh, according to our estimates that we have fulfilled our financial pledges from the past. So the hundred billion uh, euro that this year we're expecting to 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 pass for the first time and on cop uh, a delivery on on loss and damage will help to build trust trust again on um, and and hopefully 
then uh, deliver upon s- 